ready. Perfect, thank you. Colors passing through us. Purple as tulips in May, mauve into lush velvet. Purple as the stained blackberries leave on the lips, on the hands. The purple of ripe grapes, sunlit and warm as flesh. Every day, I will give you a color, like a new flower in a bud vase on your desk. Every day, I will paint you as women color each other with henna on hands and on feet. Red as henna, as cinnamon, as coals after the fire is banked, the cardinal in the feeder, the roses tumbling on the arbor, their weight bending the wood, the red of the syrup I make from petals. Orange as the perfumed fruit, hanging their globes on the glossy tree. Orange as pumpkins in the field. Orange as butterfly weed and the monarchs who come to eat. Orange as my cat running lithe through the high grass. Yellow as a goat's wise and wicked eyes. Yellow as a hill of daffodils. Yellow as dandelions by the highway. Yellow as butter and egg yolks. Yellow as a school bus stopping you. Yellow as a slicker in a downpour. Here is my bouquet. Here is a sing song of all the things you make me think of. Here is a bleak praise for the height and depth of you and the width too. Here is my box of new crayons at your feet. Green as mint jelly, green as a frog on a lily pad twanging, the green of cos lettuce upright about to bolt into opulent towers. Green as grand charters in a clear glass, green as wine bottles. Blue as cornflowers, delphiniums, bachelor's buttons. Blue as roquefort, blue as saga. Blue as still water, blue as the eyes of a Siamese cat. Blue as shadows on new snow, as a spring azure sipping from a puddle on the black top. Cobalt as the midnight sky, when day has gone without a trace, and we lie in each other's arms, eyes shut and fingers open, and all the colors of the world pass through our bodies like strings of fire. Marge Piercy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Latifa. That was absolutely exquisite. I think we're, we're time for a, a couple more verses of something, please. Perfect. The purpose of blue. But it's the colors I miss. Don't you see? The lapis sky and fair cerulean blue of ocean the precise shivering hue of your laugh on a bright day, so clear. Whatever the light, lavender appears to shave blue from gray, the way I knew you. I'm dead heading the daisy, though it's futile, sweeping leaves and weeding volunteers. My eyes close, the way whales slip from view, between the waves, I have to let you go. I still wear that specific shade of turquoise. You looking out at the Pacific Ocean, 
the way blue sky screams emptiness, its purpose forgetting or holding on. Is this beauty? And these are poems by uh, Sharon Morris, Professor of Fine Arts, Slade Deputy Director. Oh, sumptuous, lyrical, exquisite. Music to my ears. Thank you, Latifa Al Said, for what you have shared. The perfect start to the, to the conference today. Now, Latifa Al Said is an MFA painting student at the Slade. Born to parents from the East and the West, she is fascinated by cultural hybridity and that how this has shaped her senses and the lens through which she experiences the world. She says, the work I am compelled to create enables and empowers me to create, to make sense of who I am as my identity is contoured, labeled, shaped and redrawn by myself and the world around me. I would love to see your paintings, Latifa. They sound exquisite as, the, as exquisite as the words you just spoke. So my name is Lorna Collins and I welcome everyone back to day two of the Creative Lives Conference for another three hours full of rich, reflective, stimulating gems of experience, sparked in curated conversations, again, between researchers, performers, artists, experts by experience. Now this event is being recorded. Please post your questions to the speakers in the Q&A box and feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourselves to each other and to give various comments. Um, we are tweeting this event live. Um, feel free to tweet and react your own, your own thoughts to proceedings at hashtag creative lives and our account is at creative underscore lives one. To start things off, we have the brilliant JD Carpentieri in conversation with Carrie Ryan. Anne Lancely, please, can you make the introductions and set things off? Thanks so much, Lorna. Um, yes, I'm Anne Lancely and an Associate Professor in Women's Cancer at the Institute for Women's Health at UCL. Um, where my research focuses on examining the patient experience dimension of developments in the field of women's cancers. But I'm also interested in exploring innovative ways of supporting people with cancer through their treatment. And this includes investigating the therapeutic potential of using heritage and personal objects in the clinic. I collaborated with Helen Chatterjee on the Heritage in Hospitals project and the wellbeing work package of a Horizon 2020 project, um, Critical Heritage Studies and the Future of Europe, and that was under the leadership of Bev Butler. And it's a really great pleasure to introduce two panellists for this conversation on ageing, the life course and the arts. So first is Carrie Ryan. Carrie is a lecturer in biosocial medical anthropology in the Department of Anthropology at UCL. And her research examines the importance of ritual, arts, and play and games to aging well being. Her research is inspired by over 10 years of work experience as an activities coordinator in nursing homes and retirement communities. And Carrie is in conversation with J.D. Carpentieri, who's a lecturer at the UCL Institute of Education and an honorary research associate at UCL's Center for Longitudinal Studies. In his research, he's used a range of British cohort studies to investigate well-being and the life course. He's currently co-leading a qualitative longitudinal study of long COVID. Both panelists in different ways challenge conventional views of aging, carry through exploring creative, playful ways of working with older adults towards a playful aging, and JD through close analysis of older people's perspectives and experiences, which includes exploration of the benefits of playful aging. After some conversation together, um, which will get going in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, there'll be eight to 10 minutes for questions at the time. 
that's a really rich opportunity um, for you to quiz JD and Carrie on their work. And um, so I'll be keeping a careful eye on the time and making sure that you do have an opportunity to, to put your questions to JD and Carrie. So first, um, Carrie and JD, may I ask you to describe in a little more detail the nature of the work that you've been doing? Um, perhaps JD, if you want to, to kick off. Uh, yeah, happily. Thank you very much, and and to Lorna and everyone else, including Carrie. Um, so most of the research that I do involves um, conducting qualitative interviews with members of various um, uh, long-term uh, panel studies or cohort studies that are run by the Center for Longitudinal Studies at UCL. And these studies tend to, they follow people from birth all the way through their lives. And um, there's various ones, for example, people born in 1946 is, is the first big one, all the way up to people born, down to, I suppose, people born in around 2000, the Millennium Cohort Study, and there's three in between that. And these studies tend to be very quantitative, and, and the quantitative results and findings are, are extremely valuable in understanding uh, trends in the UK over the life course uh, um, and lots of lots of various interesting findings there. But what a lot of these studies tend to lack or have historically tended to lack was the perspectives and experiences of study members themselves as they as as they go through their lives. And so what I do, what hopefully adds to the cohort studies is I conduct qualitative interviews with study members and talk to them about their lives, get, me to tell, get them to tell me their, their, their life stories. Um, if, if we're talking with um, older people. So for example, I've also interviewed people in their late seventies who were born in Scotland in 1936 uh, for a different, different cohort. Um, to, to say maybe talk about their experiences of how they um, creatively adapt to the challenges that um, come with aging. So physical decline or the loss of loved ones or, or et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I try to bring those people's uh, perspectives and experiences into the broader understanding of how the life course is experienced um, here in the UK and, and more generally as well. Thanks, JD. Um, Carrie, um, be great to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, my interest in playful aging, as you said, and is really inspired and grounded in my work experience as an activities coordinator, which I began at the age of 15. And over these years of working with these women who are often really underpaid, um, I've really recognized the extraordinary importance um, of their work in injecting social life into these really medicalized institutional spaces. Um, and one of the things that became really interesting to me was that these activity directors, um, their work was often perceived to be really peripheral to the real work of care in the home. So these other nurses who were doing the kind of bathing and feeding and handing out pharmaceuticals, that was really supposed seen as kind of what was maintaining and cultivating life. Um, but these activity directors really thought that their work was integral um, and they made several observations and, and helped me see a couple of things. One was that a lot of these older adults who were not involved in activities in these nursing homes and, and retirement communities um, had a lot more illnesses, a lot more intense illnesses, and would often die faster um, than those who were deeply engaged in these activities. Um, and they really strongly believed that cultivating a social life, cultivating meaning and purpose through engagement and through kind of creative engagement really profoundly affected the health and wellness of older adults themselves. So they believed that these activities were profoundly biosocial phenomena. Um, and my work has really been trying to give that um, recognition uh, a voice um, to really make sure that um, these activities are seen for what they are. 
especially because a lot of these older adult activities um, are really denigrated um, and, and kind of perceived to be unimportant or silly or frivolous um, in, in older adults' lives. So there's a really famous activist named Maggie Kuhn who um, led the Grey Panthers, which was a, a movement to counter ageist discourse in the United States. She often called nursing homes and retirement communities play pens for the old. And she really thought these playful activities infantilized older adults, that they weren't actually meaningful engagements that had any kind of importance or worth, um, but were actually a further denigration of an older adults themselves. And as an anthropologist, we try to challenge these popular discourses and really see what older adults themselves are doing. And in my work, I've seen older adults profoundly influenced by play and games. Um, and that's really where I began. And um, my, my kind of interest in playful aging specifically came out of uh, my work on bingo. Um, bingo was a hugely popular activity in the retirement community. It is one of the most popular activities in nursing homes and retirement communities in the United States. And yet it's given no attention in the literature. No one talks about it. And that's partly because it's perceived to be this frivolous, silly game. Um, and in a kind of um, you know, Protestant ethic, capitalist America that really believes in hard work, serious pursuits, um, skill development as kind of integral to healthy old age. Bingo, which is reliant on chance, is perceived to be kind of really immoral, um, frivolous, and dangerous actually to the cultivation of health in old age. But I found something very different. Um, I watched, I played over 500 hours of bingo during my field work. And all of the older adults who played bingo played it with complete ritual devotion. Their whole weekly schedules were um, centered around bingo. They would organize their doctor's appointments, their family visits around these games. And I found that a lot of the assumptions about bingo were really wrong, that a lot of people thought that bingo was dangerous because it entranced people through this mindless rhythm. But that's exactly what older adults loved about it, because they it created a kind of social and shared embodiment. It was often an opportunity for fun. Um, people laughed in bingo more than they did anywhere else in the home. And the element of surprise of being kind of moved by this chance of watching somebody with dementia win just as much as somebody else who didn't have dementia. This was extraordinarily important to really challenge hierarchies in the home, to make people alive again to unpredictability in a very kind of scheduled environment. So fun was really important. Risk taking was really important. Um, and my work has generally been asking, you know, why is it that we don't pay attention to this? Why don't we pay attention to bingo? Why don't we pay attention to play, especially when it's so important to older adults? Um, and this is why we started this Aging Playfully project. That's fascinating. Just picking up on, on Carrie, your sort of playful description there with lots of fun and laughter and something that JD that you said in uh, in the beginning which was about these creative responses really to the whole spectrum of older aging experience and I wondered if you could between you comment on how play might address that spectrum because the sort of ele elephant in the room I guess is death and preparation and moving closer towards the end of life. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> I'll shut up and let you talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very happily. Um, I mean, as Kerry was talking, uh, the thing that popped into my mind was a, um, um, you know, perhaps abstruse or boring theoretical debate within uh, the gerontological uh, community about what is called successful aging and there's mm. theories of successful aging and these have traditionally um, uh, been biomedical uh, theories that were that conceptualized successful aging largely as the um, uh, 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 lack of physical decline or the lack of, of serious uh, chronic conditions or the lack of cognitive decline. And, and so by definition, 
um, almost no one uh, uh, ages successfully all the way through their life. And even like amongst people say in their 70s, a very small percentage uh, of people could, his, could meet these sort of traditional biomedical uh, definitions of, 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 of aging successfully. But if you actually go to talk to people, uh, uh, and, and these theories that, you know, they're, they're valuable in terms of like maybe, you know, public health policy, et cetera. So I don't want to denigrate them at all. But what's been nice is over the last, say, maybe decade or so, there's been much more openness to person-centered rather than researcher-centered uh, conceptualizations of successful aging. And if you go and you talk to people, you know, who are in their late 70s or older about what uh, uh, aging well or, or aging successfully is to them, and this picks up on something that Carrie said, it's very much about doing and being and sharing and engaging. It's not about having hips that work as well as they did when you were uh, 40 or something like that. It's not about still being able to do the exact same things that you did when you were 50, but it's about doing things that you enjoy and having purpose and pleasure and engagement and happiness in life. And um, I know some people will sometimes say, I think some, some famous, uh, a, a big shot American philosopher, I, I think I saw this in, in, in the New York Times or something recently, you know, says, oh, kill me at 70, because then I won't be able to be making a contribution to public discourse and to academia and stuff like that. And my first response to that is, yeah, I'll ask you when you're 70, whether you still want the ax or not, buddy. Um, but, but my main thought is that that's a complete misunderstanding and a very egotistical misunderstanding of what good aging is, is about for almost everyone. For almost everyone, it's about still finding fun things to do and it's being socially engaged and, and, and having hobbies and stuff. And so I, I, I'm hoping, and, I, and hopefully my work contributes at least a teeny bit to this, for a more person-centered theoretical conceptualization of what aging well or successful aging or whatever we want to call it, is over time. Yeah, Harry, do you, yeah, just to respond, I mean, I think, you know, I completely agree. I think one of the things that, um, you know, I, I've often tried to challenge in my own research is this idea of successful aging as being without decline or any kind of frailty. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is that kind of gerontology has created um, a very harsh binary, whether you're kind of an older person who's really suffering with a lot kind of at the end of their life, um, making very difficult decisions um, in deep pain, or you're a healthy older adult um, exercising and biking and going on these huge engagements. But there's so much in between. Um, and one of the things that I think this Aging Playfully project helps to really um, underline is that um, you can, as JD said, really create um, new forms of embodiment, new forms of identity. You can play with your decline. You can find new ways of engaging and working with it. Um, and this, I think, is also an attempt. I think one of the things that gerontology often does is it focuses on very kind of serious issues with older adults. Um, end of life care decision making, frailty, you know, all of these kinds of things we've been talking about it very rarely talks about how older adults are living their lives to the fullest, how they're exploring, how they're recreating themselves, especially as older adults and the limits of our lives are expanding. You know, this kind of ingenuity that older adults are having to go through right now as they're kind of aging in, in a kind of unprecedented way, they're playing around with what that means, what that, what that means biologically as well as socially. And I found that these games open themselves, open these older adults to that playfulness, to being able to take risks, to be able to reimagine themselves. Um, and it also really kind of underlines that older adults have a way more diverse experience, um, that they are keeping engaged, 
But contrary to popular belief, they're not these very kind of stagnant, um, unchanging individuals. They're constantly evolving. Um, and I think play as a frame helps open up those questions in a way that other kinds of frames that gerontology is often turned to don't. I think it's really interesting that sort of uh, evolution within older age. One of the things that constantly drives me crazy is you'll see a study and it says, we interviewed older people, brackets, aged 54 to 89 or something like that, or age 62 to 89. And I'm thinking that's a pretty big spectrum there. And there's gonna be, what can we say about the typical 88 year old that that's relevant for the typical 62 year old? We, we can't just see older people or older age as this, amorphous mass that starts at age 65 or whatever and is just the same throughout there's there's evolution and adaptation and and development within that time period within that stage of life uh, one of the things i'll oh, sorry i'll say one more one more thing as well in one of the cohort studies that i've worked with um People were asked at age 50, and we asked like 10,000 people this question. So at age 50, they were asked, uh, this was in a, 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 a survey to, that had loads of other questions, of course. Imagine that you are now 60 years old. Please write a few lines about the life you are leading, your interests, your home life, your health, your well-being, et cetera. And we got about 8,000 responses to, to, to this question on this study. And one of the things that fascinated me was, um, and this was for a cohort for whom at least the females, the, the state pension age was 60. So 60 was seen as the sort of next, next phase of life for a lot of people. And people, uh, loads of the responses, people conceptualized their life post 60 as a new age of play. Um, so they were very often talking about, oh, the responsibilities of work and child rearing are going to be, I'm gonna have left that behind and I'm gonna spend loads of time doing the things that I love doing. I'm going to play golf three times a week or I used to make art, but I had to give that up to become a graphic designer to pay the bills. I'm gonna go back to making fine art or whatever the case might be, or even if they weren't going to do artistic stuff or creative stuff, they wanted to create playful lives in that stage of their life. And, and there was a very strong sense of that. This is an age of play coming through these responses, which I found, um, very heartening and, and very exciting. And it made me think that the, 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 these people who at the time were 50 are way ahead of most uh, researchers, gerontologists, whatever, in terms of how they're conceptualizing what their retirement was going to be like or what that stage of life was going to be like. I'll stop. Really quickly, I think one of the things too, there's a kind of um, political message behind the aging playfully, which is to kind of protect leisure. You know, I think one of the things that we've tried to do is to really um, instrumentalize old age, make it more productive, get people volunteering, get people working later and later in life. Um, and, and we don't, I think, I think the, the ability for older adults to do what JD is saying is really get back into those things that work made it difficult for them to enjoy is also decreasing. We're wanting them to do more serious things, to work on themselves, to make themselves healthier for our nations so that they're not a burden. Um, but I think it's really important to safeguard that leisure, safeguard that play. Uh, we have to have some time for that. That was one of the huge kind of, um, you know, achievements in, in the 20th century was to allow retirement to exist, to, um, you know, to really allow older adults to have time away from work. And yet we've tried to kind of rework work in to retirement. So play too, there's a, a kind of a political pushback to say, actually, no, um, let's have that time. Let's protect that time instead of really having these kind of capitalist overtones um, on, on the kind of uh, years post work. Um, just got five more minutes for the conversation. And uh, something I, I just wanted to 
um, put to you in relation to the playfulness. Um, do you think that that um, part of its magic in a way um, and its energizing potential comes from the way in which it sort of alters time and um, creates a very special, almost you know, liminal type of space out um, and whether that has a, you know, um, a lasting you know, element to it, which, which helps people? This was exactly what I saw in bingo. Um, I, I kind of theorized bingo is time out of time. It was a ritual. Um, and the way that bingo kept time. So one of the other things that I noticed is that older adults in the retirement community would often fall asleep um, when they were sitting on chairs in the retirement community. They'd often fall asleep in activities themselves, but no one ever fell asleep in bingo. And that was because it's rhythmic attention, the way it really intensified over time, people were alert, they were wondering what was going to happen, what, what surprise was next. This kept people guessing. And in many ways, that kind of timekeeping was so counter to how the institution kept time, which was so predictable. Everything was on a tight schedule. Everyone knew what was going to be next. And here bingo comes along and surprise is interjected in again. And I think one of the things, you know, in a lot of these institutions, they're so all about risk management, try to control things, try to make things predictable. And play is a fundamental counter to that. It says, actually, let's take risks. Let's inject something that's new, unpredictable, that will surprise us, that might actually kind of push us off guard. Um, and we'll have to adapt to that. And that's precisely where life comes in because life is unpredictable. Um, that's you know, one of the things that kills people in these institutions is that there is nothing to be alert for because you know what it's going to be in advance. But games are very different and keep you alert through surprise. You're muted, Anne. Oh, I, I thought I wouldn't do that, but I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's quite a powerful statement to to sort of open the the, the conversation up to questions. And um, there's one um, from Autumn that came in about um, your uh, re research approaches, and I think it was something that you touched on, JD, uh, uh, that the research seems to reflect ageist attitudes generally, um, and you know, your approaches are very different, but how might we tackle this, you know, ageism in research, um, ageist attitudes in, in research? Um, I'll, um, I mean, one thing I should say is that I definitely don't want to set up any sorts of binary in which it's qualitative good, quantitative bad. Both, both um, sort of paradigms have their strengths, but also both do have their weaknesses. And, um, you know, the reason we're not all smoking cigarettes right now is because of very good quantitative, uh, quantitative longitudinal research. Uh, we live longer because of research like that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, to my mind, the key is for researchers from whatever uh, background or whatever uh, uh, orientations they have to work together and to be in conversation. And for those conversations, whether it's about methods or whatever, to very, very actively involve the people that you're going to be researching as well, the types of people that you're going to be researching. So. I'm working on um, one of the, I'm lucky enough to be working on one of the big long COVID studies that there's a bit of sudden, you know, explosion of these. And uh, thankfully, um, the, the, the study that I'm working on, in addition to all the incredible uh, uh, work that it's doing, quantitatively, it includes a qualitative element in which we can look at how people experience uh, uh, having long COVID and, and, and coping with it, et cetera, uh, over time, over the next couple of years. And in that study, which will include older people as well, but people of all ages, 
the key is for the different research teams to be in constant dialogue with each other so that one sort of finding or approach isn't seen as the right approach or the better approach. Mm. I don't know, what do you think, Carrie? Yeah, I, I, I mean, as an anthropologist, we always say just hang out with people you know, watch what people do. I think this is the thing is that all of this discourse around bingo, it actually made it invisible to me for quite a while. I was playing lots of bingo, seeing how important it was. And yet I didn't think that it was good enough for my dissertation to think about. Um, and so when I really stuck with the practices, you know, follow the people is what anthropologists say. That's when you start to see things open up. That's when you get to see how discourses fall apart um, and you also see way more nuance in how people are living and reimagining their older adult lives. And I think on that front, we have to remember whatever our, our backgrounds or our approaches to not be arrogant as, as researchers. Like, you know, I might think that such and such is the super most important thing in the, in the people I'm studying's lives. But if I'm paying attention to them and there's constant flags up that other things are more important to them, I need to, to, to park my ego or my preconceptions and, and follow the people, as, as you say, Carrie. And I, I think that's with something like bingo or something, that's such a perfect example of something that doesn't seem important. And like one of my backgrounds is in uh, narrative analysis and this often centers the importance of people having a good strong story about their lives and there's a fear that in older age people will enter what's called epilogue time where nothing new is happening and there's been a tendency to see that as inevitably a bad thing but I think that tendency doesn't take account of things like play what if what if you're not accomplishing anything new in your final decade of life and your life is somewhat limited, but you're still having fun? You're still playing bingo twice a week and you're having a great time and you're still getting excited. I don't think the word epilogue does that justice at all. Uh, and so I think that even my background of narrative analysis needs to think a bit more and pay more attention to what people are doing and how they're getting meaning over their life course. From what you've both said um, just now about being with the people, close observation and attention to what people are saying and the narratives, um, there's not anything methodologically or practically that's different in research with older adults. Is that right? I'm not... Carrie, do you want to take this? In by kind of, can you can you say that again, Anne? Like, what do you mean? A kind of yeah, tip? well, you Third know, is there anything um, unique or particular about researching with older adults? Um, you know, in in terms of practically how you go about the research, or in terms of your methodology or theoretical positions, there are some, there's some interesting chat about concepts which you know underpin people's research. Um, so from Michael um, using salutogenesis um, and and assemblage as theories to explain um, creative aging and um, dynamics of, of, of aging. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things I would say to that is that, you know, as an anthropologist, we're always thinking about how our own positionality really shapes how we understand and uh, the field, you know, people that we're interacting with. One of the things that was always foremost on my mind was that I was a lot younger than these older adults. I mean, one of the things that I, I, they would do often before an activity would begin is they'd say juggle for us or you know do some dancing and I think they enjoyed the kind of embodiment that I still had um, that they didn't have any longer and you know asking these questions across that age gap is really hard um, how do you not other older adults when you're young? Um, and this is one of the things that anthropologists have long asked themselves, um, especially anthropologists who've been interested in aging, is 
How um, do anthropologists who age across their own life course, how are they able to see and to understand and to ask newer, more nuanced questions about old age once they get there themselves? Um, and I think this was really kind of built in. Um, and, you know, I've actually had some people ask me, is your own kind of obsession with play also a kind of obsession with forcing a kind of youthfulness on old age? Um, and I, I would say actually, no, I mean, in, in some way I can understand where they're coming from, but older adults were doing it themselves. So, you know, I didn't have to make this up or force the issue. They were doing it before I got to the retirement community. They're going to do it afterwards. Um, and that's really where, you know, sticking with what people are saying, sticking with what people are doing to challenge, you know, my own kind of youthful conceptions or uh, ideas about what play might mean to me. That's really where that kind of work of surprise of, of being kind of proven wrong um, and making mistakes over and over again, I think is done. Yeah, and I think that that making play and youth synonymous I, I, I worry that that's the fact that they're in practice often synonymous, that play is, is synonymous with, with childhood. That might just be more a function of how society is structured rather than how the human, human beings are structured and what we want out of life and are able to get. And as I was saying with these people, who were 50 and who were imagining their lives after retirement, they were like, oh, thank God all that stuff is over, that it was rewarding, it was worthwhile, but now I get to play again and I am grabbing that with both hands. Uh, so I, I think that the play youth Venn diagram deserves some picking apart, really. There's, um, there's one, we've got time for one last question, I think. Um, and this is from Eva San Saviour. What have you learned about how intersectionality shapes the opportunities for and or possibilities for playful aging? Your um, sure, three I'll minutes from now. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll say something very quickly is that one of the studies I'm working on is a, 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 a pandemic specific survey of how people responded to the pandemic. And it includes 74 year olds. And something that is very, very clear is a lot of people responded by saying like how they adapted to the pandemic, especially the early months was by very playfully like, uh, like say playing online bridge or learning how to do new things like WhatsApp that felt very creative and exciting to them. But something that came through really clearly in the responses was people saying, like, I know I'm privileged. So for example, I get to play and uh, do stuff in my garden, which, which they viewed as like part of a playful old age, but it's because I have a garden. I get to go uh, down to the local uh, seaside or whatever, but it's because I can afford a nice house near the seaside. And most people don't have this, so they don't have, they don't get to respond in the way that I get to respond, which just isn't fair, really. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Carrie, one minute. <laughs> really quickly, I think, you know, as you say, there's, there is a kind of privilege that comes along. One thing is that, you know, oftentimes these activity coordinators come in very research rich, resource rich homes. Um, but one thing to this intersectionality point that I have found really interesting is the way in which play allows di different people, different older adults across abilities to participate. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the things that I have found really poignant um, is the way that older adults are using online gaming who can't move her maybe immobile, they can't get out of their homes very much and they use this online gaming to really connect to the world. Bingo actually collapsed social hierarchies across both ability and race. Um, one of the things is that people in bingo would sit down by racial groups at tables. Um, but after bingo was played, people were talking across tables. So hmm. there's a kind of power in, in creating this liminal space in these games, this ability to reimagine social life that actually challenges some of these divisions that we create. Um, and I think more time should be spent on, on play as a way really to connect people across really starkly divided 
um, societies, also transgenerationally. I mean, this is another thing we're seeing is young people playing with older adults and games as being that connection. That's fantastic. Um, Carrie and JD, thanks for getting us off to a, a very lively and wonderful start for the second day of the conference. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, JD and Anne for your um, organization of that brilliant initial conversation. I've learned so much. And the thing that sticks out for me is thinking about play not attached to youth. It redefines the contours of play and life. So thank you. Next, we have artists. We have Rebecca Lowerth in conversation with Ruth Siddle, chaired by Joe Volley. So I will hand over to Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to the previous speakers and also to Latifah who gave that wonderful uh, reading earlier today. Um, I'm Joe Volley. I'm an artist and I'm deputy director uh, at the State School of Fine Art uh, projects and I'm the um, I run the materials research project and uh, I'm delighted to chair this session on arts well-being and welfare and to introduce two speakers both uh, of whom I've had the good fortune to work alongside at the Slade and UCL on a number of projects uh, as with the uh, annual colour and poetry symposium, colour and emotion, uh, pigment timeline uh, project and um, although we've um, We've, we're very familiar and uh, have wonderful conversations together. We haven't had a conversation quite in this situation before. And I started to think about Matisse's conversation, conversations with Picasso. And one of them said to the other, it's never quite, um, it's, it's never quite clear who said it to whom, but Matisse said to Picasso, or Picasso said to Matisse, we must put, talk to each other as much as we can. When one of us dies, there will be some things the other will never be able to talk of with anyone else. So I think this is a really unique situation. Rebecca Loweth is an artist who works in arts and health and social prescribing, specializing in art workshops that encourage learning through the making, predominantly in the medium of collage. Her art practice focuses on the concept of artifice and the aspirations of ideals. These ideas serve as the impetus to produce film, collage, and sculpture. Dr. Ruth Siddle is currently UCL student mediator. She has worked in, a, in student experience and support at UCL as a student residences warden and as Dean of Students. She has a research and teaching background in the earth sciences and geoheritage. In 2019, she was a scientist in residence at the Slade School of Fine Art and for a number of years has been involved with the Slade Materials Research Project and Network. Um, Rebecca and Ruth have, um, have, are happy to take questions for the last 10 minutes and I'm going to hand over to them because I know they've got this worked out and don't really need me. So over to both of you and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jo. Um, yeah, just to clarify, I'm, I am not an artist, I'm a natural scientist, as Jo just said. Um, but I think, you know, Rebecca and I have an interesting synergy and we're not, we are not actively researching in the same, the same way that Carrie and JD were into this field of, you know, um, well-being in general and, you know, good things. But we are, I guess, practitioners in that field. And I've been on a steep learning curve as somebody who's come from a very much um, natural sciences background, I'm a geologist. Um, and I've become much more involved in outreach in that field over recent years. And I found that an incredibly positive experience, both the people I work with who are, are mainly in that huge category of, you know, people over 60 to 90. Um, but also my experience as, a, as being scientist in residence, I've, I work on the science of materials and cultural heritage. Um, but more recently I've started to draw and create what some people might describe as art. I wouldn't necessarily do that, but you know, I found that an incredibly therapeutic experience. So Rebecca, over to you. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, Joe covered a lot of what my kind of practice is about. Um, but yeah, I'm an artist educator. Um, 
uh, interested in arts and health and social prescribing. Um, and I have to say, I was nodding away to the, the previous talk just now, talking about play. Um, I'm really interested in play and well-being. Um, uh, and this idea of processing reality through play and the ritual that comes with that, just sitting down, giving yourself the space to make. Um, so yeah, that was a, a really interesting point for me. Um, and generally I work with charities, schools and museums uh, leading mainly collage based uh, workshops um, around arts and health and wellbeing and mostly kind of group settings. Um, and I also work a lot with uh, UCL departments lately um, around uh, wellbeing workshops. Um, I've been working with arts and humanities uh, faculty within UCL um, with various initiatives that they are pushing. Um, next week they're doing a, re a replenish festival. So I'm involved in that. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it for me. I also work at the Slade um, on outreach and engagement projects. Um, and I also uh, teach for the short courses where actually that is mostly where we officially met, I guess, Ruth, um, when you did my collage course. Like 2018? I don't know. I think yeah. it was in <laughs> No, it must have been, it was the year I was scientist in residence. So I think that was 2019. But anyway, yes, yeah. a couple of years ago. I've lost track of time with the pandemic. But yeah, I mean, that leads me on to what I was going to start talking to you about or asking you about to tell us a little bit more about the these workshops you've run and the kind of people who attend them and, and, you know, what effect that they've had on people who are maybe doing artistic practice for the first time. Yeah, so I've been really lucky to kind of work with different groups of people within um, my time kind of working with wellbeing and arts and health. So um, I work with schools. Um, so with that, I will um, uh, often kind of do a, a projection based um, workshop which will be kind of the the students will be working with um digital and analog projectors they'll be using their phones to kind of uh, create a kind of video and photography works um and obviously kind of want to tailor each workshop to the specific audience so with that one you know if people are you know at that stage they're usually developing their portfolios and things and this is a really great workshop to get people to um make a lot of work very quickly so it's very kind of like satisfying and um they can see that they're making improvements and you know really kind of producing a lot of work and um, so this gives a lot of confidence and with them using their phones i think that's a really good access point for them and um, you know they're kind of having to be active participants in it they're moving around the projectors you know things are changing constantly and they're trying to document that um I also work with um, charities that are kind of like, um, I was working with King's Cross Living Centre for a time. Um, that was an amazing um, kind of experience. We were looking at, um, it was kind of an elderly group that I was working with specifically um, and they would meet every week and I was producing projects for them around memory. Um, and so this was an amazing kind of opportunity to see um, the group kind of sharing with each other um, and obviously kind of building up confidence in just kind of starting conversations with maybe people in the group that they hadn't spoken to before. And you could really see that that was, you know, that morning a week was really um, such a supportive environment for that group. Um, so that was kind of a, a different kind of audience that I worked with then. Um, I also work, uh, as I said, with like UCL departments. So that will be, um, you know, various kinds of, um, um, kind of admin groups or things like that um, so often people kind of very stressed and working very hard and this is their half an hour out of their day that they've managed to put aside to kind of focus on themselves and their own kind of creative output um, and this audience might not be kind of arty at all and just kind of giving it a go um, so again I think it's really brave to even attend those um, workshops um, and you know people can be kind of maybe a bit withdrawn or kind of skeptical of the exercise um but i've learned to kind of pace it in a certain way so that um we have kind of a couple of quick warm-up exercises with either drawing or collage and um, and that kind of with certain kind of like self-consciousness i think and kind of 
um, pressure to kind of create something amazing in your first go. So um, I think it's really important to kind of think of um, the pace for the, the group and things. Um, so yeah, one of the things I was going to ask you, Becky, was yeah. about um, how you think the, the different media you use are useful for people, especially with, you know, no background at all in, in creative arts, you know, people who maybe haven't picked up a pencil and drawn anything since primary school. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit more about the media and collage and drawing and yeah. printmaking and film and so on? Yeah, so I think I found, obviously collage is kind of my, my creative background, but I really have found that that is a really effective um, kind of entry point for people and um, especially who uh, don't consider themselves creative um, I think that is partly to do with a kind of perception that you might not need and um, kind of like a skill to give that a go um, it helps that again like I say it's a very kind of immediate process um, and I think there is a link back to, again to play and that kind of like well I have kind of done this when I was younger or <laughs> blah, blah, blah. so there's that kind of um, a slight kind of familiarity, I guess, um, which can also, I think, put people off a bit and kind of be like, oh, more collage, I don't know, that. But um, I think I have found that to be the most effective um, with groups. Um, and that can also evolve into drawing and things. I often do that. So people might start with collage and then that can be a step on. To, I think we did that together, didn't we? That, you know, you would draw your collages afterwards and um, collage can be part of a process um, into painting or sculpture or whatever. Um, and then with drawing specifically, I have actually started recently to kind of experiment with, um, I did this for um, a women in leadership group uh, the other day. And um, so um, the presenter kind of started the session and then kind of handed over to me quickly. Um, and I just did a five minute exercise with the group, which was based um, in drawing. And it was um, two, uh, two minute exercises that they um, were doing. Very, very simple. It was a kind of like blind drawing and then drawing from memory kind of thing. But that was the feedback I got from that was that that kind of, um, I think sometimes we're rushing around from one meeting to another. This was a you know kind of a course that people were doing so they really needed to kind of invest in and concentrate in it um, and having this kind of five minutes to kind of oof, totally get out of that headspace and into something else focus on that thing which you weren't expecting to do and this drawing and uh, kind of um going into a completely different headspace then allowed people to become very very focused and um in tune with the rest of the course so, have you yeah. ever had sorry sorry to, yeah, on, yeah, yeah, I was just thinking you know have you ever had anybody that's come along and uh found that it's not what they expected you know and maybe not engaging maybe because they they're seeing it as child's play you know sticking pasta to paper with glitter and that sort of thing yeah. you know, do you have people who don't engage and and you know how do you, how would you deal with that yeah, so that, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I have definitely had those experiences, luckily not too often, um, but I will do, um, say for like a museum or something, I, I might be doing drop-in sessions um, where it's anybody from the public, so it might be children coming in, older people, everyone. Um, and yeah, you can sometimes see people come you know, out, out of their own choice, but also again, very skeptical, sit down, maybe you're not kind of engaging with the project. So um, I like to kind of um, go over, speak to that person one-on-one, -on -one, kind of find how to engage them, where that access point is on the, what we're doing. And I think just that kind of one-to-one -one attention sometimes can just be a bit um, calming for that person, put them at ease. You go, oh, okay, so I can maybe make this that I'm interested in with the collage. And um, I find that that really helps. Um, and you often find that those people who are skeptical and kind of shy at the beginning will stay the longest and just continue making <laughs> when I'm packing up and everything. So, yeah, it's kind of really opening people's eyes to a new experience. And, I, you know, there are a lot of residences there with this with play, aren't there? You know, and suddenly finding that you you've got permission to enjoy something that you wouldn't normally let yourself do. Absolutely. And, you know, I think my last question really for you, Becky, is about how what you know what kind of what, you, what what your key performance indicators how what kind of evidence do you see in terms of improvement of well-being 
throughout these classes? Yeah, I have um, really tried to always kind of keep up with um, like the feedback forms and things after my um, workshop. So that does really, really help to then improve on for the next one. And I think that's where I've really picked up um, this idea of pacing the workshops and when to do which exercise. Um, I really, yeah, I think like kind of like the top things that I've um, had fed back to me is that just setting that side of time, setting that side, that time aside for that person to kind of focus on themselves, have that ritual, have that space, have that time to play has been very important. And that's even down to the walk to the studio to kind of separate themselves from the office or whatever it is um, to kind of be in a different space. Um, and one that is supportive and I think yeah kind of talking back about the the charities as well I think that was a very similar thing like that was coming out of your home environment um which might not have been ideal um and then you're coming into this kind of very supportive kind of playful environment where you can um kind of speak to, to new people and kind of forget about things and absorb yourself um in the task and I think um yeah, and said something really nice earlier um, around play. You said that um, play alters time. And I think that um, is a really, yeah, that's a real kind of takeaway point for me. I think this idea that, um, which I definitely experienced myself, that I get really absorbed in the making. And um, I think you're slowly processing, you know, problems that you're going through or kind of solving, solving issues. Um, uh, yeah, I forgot, I forgot where I was going now. Um, yeah, and this kind of idea of um, learning um, and using your hands and this idea of, um, yeah, I think sharing with people and those conversations that happen are really, really important aside from the making as well. I think it is really interesting, isn't it, that, you know, there, there are multiple gains from these kind of experiences. You know, it's you get some headspace away from what is the norm for you, but you're also learning something. And that is a really important takeaway. And and there's the social side of it, you know, so I think it is a win win situation or indeed a win 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 situation for people who are doing these courses. And I think that's something I'm really kind of interested myself is that creative learning for want of a better phrase you know where you you're not doing that in a pressured environment you're not going to be examined at the end of it you know you don't have to put on a although I do remember I did get a crit from you at the end of our, yeah. <laughs> our collage course but yeah I think you know that's I think people I found that people really like to be able to take something away and that necessarily isn't necessarily a piece of um, art that they've, they've created you know but it could be knowledge it could be a new skill it could be a new friendship you know and I think yeah. those are really important things about this experience yeah and, and things that you know me coming from a you know a, a background as a scientist I didn't necessarily um, think about until it became obvious that that's what was happening that's what happened to me as well in my experiences yeah yeah I think and we can kind of segue now into kind of talking about your background and um, your experiences of um, social prescribing. But of course, um, you also do a geology walks, don't you, with, with yeah. groups where, yeah. So I'd be really interested to hear kind of about your experiences of kind of social prescribing and also um, your experiences of kind of facilitating that as well and how you kind of on about that yeah well I think it's you know I had this uh, fairly major change of career from being an academic geologist to working a lot in um, student support and well-being within within UCL specifically um so you know working um as a, a warden sort of house mother in uh, student residences and then becoming dean of students you know where at the time I had oversight over um student support and well-being and now in my role as student mediator and um, you know and I, I enjoy those those jobs you know it was it was definitely not something that was forced upon me I, I made that change out of choice um, but you know I was kind of suddenly had this huge kind of crisis of conscious that you know I had all this knowledge as a geologist that I wasn't necessarily going to use again which you know up until then had been you know a, a major 
thing in my adult life. And so um, I started off doing outreach and this um, manifested itself in terms of doing geological work, walk. So um, one of my um, research expertise is in earth sciences is, is looking at building stones and the building materials that are used archeologically up until, you know, modern day London. And um, former colleagues, retired colleagues in earth sciences had started doing urban geological walks. And I guess this, you know, this was something I was interested in. Um, not only because geology, traditional field geology, is not particularly accessible. You've got to be yeah. fit and active. You've got to be able to walk up mountains, not on paths, you know, walk literally cross country. And it's, it's, it, it, it blocks a lot of people from doing that activity. And um, if you go and walk around a city, you can make that completely accessible. You can avoid stairs you can avoid steep slopes you can avoid rough ground you can avoid water but you can still look at rocks and actually you can look at rocks that have been nicely polished on the front of a bank or you know cut to show good examples of fossils and you know it's not the same thing um from a scientific point of view of seeing rocks in their natural environment but you know it's it's good and you know a lot of people are interested in fossils and things like that and um so I started doing these geological walks as I say at first quite well grudgingly isn't the right uh attitude but I guess I came at it because um I was doing an older colleague a favor who had retired and moved to the southwest and he couldn't come up to London and fulfill a commitment so I stood in for him and uh and I kind of went with an attitude of, you know, right, let's just kind of get this over. And I was absolutely bowled over by the enthusiasm of the participants, by their genuine interest. And, you know, they were from a mixed background in terms of um, geology. You know, some people had got degrees in geology, other people, um, you know, didn't know, really know anything about it. And... Um, and it was just such a lovely experience. I just came back with a real warm glow and thought, right, I'm going to do more of this. And, um, you know, and I don't do a huge amount because I don't have a lot of time, but I do probably about four or five walks a year. Uh, probably, I would say probably one every two months. And I do those either as kind of commissions for organisations like UCL or the Geological Society, but I also do them for a, a, a tourist walking tour tour company as well where you know you get people from all over the world and and I prefer those because you get very few people with a background in geology and people are just there because they want to learn about the natural history of cities and um you know it's again you kind of see people coming along sometimes they're there because they want to be you know they're there by choice but coming along feeling a bit nervous that they're not mm. going to understand stuff and then just totally getting into it you know yeah. over the course Engaging of totally. yeah so when you started these um these tours did you kind of view them in like a social prescribing context or did not you at all that along yeah not at all I just saw it as you know that this was uh you know it was kind of the equivalent to to say I was standing in for somebody who couldn't make it and you know it felt a bit like giving a lecture in a way you know given that a lot of my teaching as an academic geologist had been in field geology, you know, teaching outside the classroom is normal for me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, the seeing this kind of enthusiasm build, you know, and the kind of comments and feedback that I would get back later, you know, that how they were going to show their grandchildren, take them to this place where there are really cool, foss really cool fossils <laughs> you see, and, you know, they were going to bring their grandkids there. I don't know what it is. I mainly work with older people. Mm. Um, I do very little re outreach with children. But there is one thing I find with geology is that um, it's always assumed to be for kids. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, going to the Natural History Museum, is somewhere you take the kids going to the national gallery is somewhere you try not to take the kids you know and and i'm really fascinated about that and you know often when i when i visit other cities abroad um you know i 
a geological museum or the geological survey is on my tourist highlights and you know they're always listed as um kids activities and guidebooks you know yeah. and I think, what <laughs> and you know that's how I mainly work with older people and um you know, who maybe may have had an interest in geology when they were kids and didn't have that opportunity to pursue it. And um, yeah, well, I can categorically say it's not for kids. People are really interested in it and start, you know, wanting to get deeper than, you know, just naming your top 10 favourite dinosaurs. You know, yeah. they want to know more about the stuff that I'm interested in, which is, you know, earth processes, plate tectonics, how these yeah. rocks got there. And, and actually, you know, in a building context, I'm also interested in the archeology span and the social history of stone as well. You know, why one stone has been used over another, you know, what, yeah. what were the choices there? So I've gone a little bit off track there. No, I know, <laughs> I know what you were saying about the idea of people wanting to pass on that information that yeah. you had given them, you know, and kind of like sharing that with others. Um, I, I kind of imagine that, you know, they'll go away. So kind of like boosted and energized from, you know the, the tour um but I think there's also an element of like when you're passing that on that's also you kind of carrying that buzz on a bit um yeah. and then I think that kind of relates back to like what you were saying like how you feel after doing uh the tours and stuff and how as a leader you kind of get a real kind of energy from that yeah. maybe at the beginning a bit unexpectedly but um that's the kind of maybe yeah a bit of an unexpected kind of um benefit for yourself for doing the tours yeah, because I think, you know, um, I've spent most of my adult life being told by people outside the earth sciences, you know, by which I mean kind of journalists, TV producers, um, that, you know, geology isn't cool. People are not interested in it unless, you, unless it's volcanoes or dinosaurs, you know. Um, neither of which I'm a particular expert on. I'm a lot better on volcanoes than dinosaurs, though. Uh, you know, and it's it sort of it's seen as one of those things that's not cool. And I think there's a problem with disciplines that you don't traditionally learn at school. Uh, like, you know, like law, people who go into study law tend to have family who are in law. You don't learn law at A level or, uh, you know, you don't learn, learn anything about law at school, you know, and engineering as well, to a certain extent. And geology is like that. You don't, very few people have got an A level in geology. And, um, and I think, you know, it's one of those kind of subjects that actually geologists are quite, well, we, we're so used to being called nerds that we kind of keep it to ourselves. And then, and so it was a big shock for me. And I think shock is the right word. You know, when I started sharing this with people, the, the, the feedback and the response from those people was, uh, was astonishing, you know? And um, so, you know, that there was a genuine interest there and people really felt that they'd learned something brand new that they could not have learned anywhere else. And, you know, they went away from that with a buzz. And, um, you know, and I've made friends with people who come on walking tours who had never mm -hmm. seen before, you know, because they're regulars, you know, and so there were so many, there were so many positives to it. I can't, you know, I can't really say what they are, you know, it's been just been a lovely experience. And of course, you're out in the fresh air as well, and you're getting some exercise. Um, yeah, absolutely. You're not sitting in a, in a classroom that, or a church hall or something like that, you know. Yeah. So I think it works so much better than having, uh, you know, a kind of show and tell nature table experience of learning about rocks and minerals. Yeah, absolutely. I was... Um, thinking back to your intro and how you were saying about um you're doing a regular kind of drawing um workshop session that you're joining as a participant um do you do you find there's any kind of like link through to your kind of um geological kind of style of drawing and yeah <laughs> well funny you should say that because drawing is an you know geology is a very much an observational science and drawing is an intrinsic part of that you know so we are encouraged to create field sketches um, of outcrops of landscapes of fossils you know at all scales um, so some moderate skill in drawing but it's very representational drawing rather than mm -hmm. artistic drawing um, so the drawing class that I've been doing over lockdown actually was set up by a friend of mine who's also a geologist um, but she is uh, she's got way more qualifications as an artist 
than than I have. And uh, she, you know, she just set this up as fun, you know, for a group of us. Some people are um, have got a fine arts background. Most yeah. people like me, you know, just having a go. It's just something to do. It's been something to keep us in a community during lockdown. But again, yeah, I found it. Um, I found it something to look forward to. And, uh, you know, it's pushed me in directions that I wouldn't normally have gone, you know, to use different media like charcoal or pastels mm. or, you know, beyond the pencil. And, and actually thinking about, you know, about that mark making and what it means and how it, how it is used in different disciplines from architecture, landscape architecture, geology, landscape drawing um, and I think you know probably look at you know because of my background in the earth sciences I am interested in in landscapes and also because I've worked a lot in archaeology I've been very interested in how landscapes are perceived by people of different disciplines as well mm -hmm. you know what I see in a landscape is not necessarily what you would see in a landscape as an artist yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. and it's not what an archaeologist might see and it's not what a farmer might see and I'm really interested in that kind of layering yeah our perception of the thing yeah but yeah back to your original question I mean personally I found this um this kind of new creative strand of my life to be be hugely beneficial to my mm. mental health in general and just general feelings of happiness and yeah. you know um I don't think my work is particularly good and that's because I spend too much time hanging around the slate but I'm also <laughs> I'm also immensely proud we can, of what we can fix that room. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also immensely proud of what I produce you know and then you know we heard Latifah's lovely poem at the beginning and Lorna was saying that she would love to say see Latifah's art and can I just say to everybody look at Latifah's art because it is just the most gorgeous stuff ever you know and I and and I think because I'm in that that I've got that slight toe in that fine art world it yeah I feel a bit like um I'm at primary school daubing away with my pain <laughs> <laughs> so okay. that's difficult too thank you um we're at 12 minutes past we 12 are. according yeah. to my computer so we have eight minutes for questions and just to make it clear that was Marge Pierce's poem read beautifully by uh, Latifah. Um, we do have some questions coming in and so rather than me go on I mean I just wanted to say one thing though I think the thing about uh, I've been teaching you know for many well I've been teaching at Slade for 36 years but um, you know it's that group activity I think I think the same thing on your walks and I've done those yes. walks with him. Yes. we've done different types of walks together and and like the live yeah. class or the collage class or when I've run projects like the colour and emotion where people are all got a similar goal I think there's something very comforting so it's not a very good word really but there is something about that engagement and that connective connectiveness yeah. I think as human beings we, we we gravitate towards that anyway we do have a question from Sarah on the Q&A. And do you consider the use of colour in your work? Do you think it has an effect on someone's well-being? Well, I, for one, work with colour all the time and colour in motion, and I'm a firm believer in it. I worked on many projects and it was Pablo Casals said, perhaps it's music that will save the world. Well, Joe Volley said, perhaps it's colour that will save the world. But I, I'm, I'm anyway to be the chair. So either of you, would, if you would like to answer the question on the use of colour and how it affects someone's well-being. Do you want to go first, Ruth, because you're there? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, kind of, um, as Joe well knows, the reason I've kind of fallen in with Joe in the Slade is that one of my um, academic research is applying geology to artist pigments, and I've studied and published on the analysis of artist pigments for the last 20 or so years. Um, so, you know, I'm really interested in these materials and, um, but, you know, the beauty is a definite driver behind my interest, you know, there's nothing more beautiful than a row of jars of lovely coloured pigments to me, you know, it just looks incredible. In fact, Joe usually has a pigment collection behind her as a background. Can't do it on Zoom. Can't do it. Um, <laughs> But you know, they are, again, they're really beautiful things. And if anybody's seen in UCL's cloisters, our display of um, pigments, really mm. beautiful things. But you know, I'm interested in them at a microscopic scale. And let me tell you, they get even more beautiful the more you zoom in on them. 
Um, but yeah, you know, I think that there are, I, I do have um, really kind of visceral reactions to, to certain colours, you know, and, and these are the not surprising ones, you know, you open a jar of cadmium yellow or ultramarine and the colour is just, when you yeah. see that as a pure pigment, it's just astonishing. And, um, you know, in a grey November in Bloomsbury, you know, if I open up my jar of cadmium yellow, it really sets me up for the day. Oh, <laughs> With your mask on. <laughs> yeah, because it is, they are, you know, it's like yeah. being hit in the solar plexus by this colour. It's just yeah. fantastic. So I do react well to colour. I love colour yeah. and it cheers yeah. me up. Yeah. yeah there's well, an emotional I, reaction to colour, isn't there? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, can, I find with my um, workshops, it can, off, if someone is struggling, kind of focusing in on colour as like a starting point to lift them off again is a really good kind of um, access point, a way in. Yeah. And, and of course, Joe, you and you and Nia Seagal have done lots of work yeah. on colour and emotion as well. Yeah. 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 And we, well, that's been a project been going on for some time and um, it's ongoing. And it was to create a, um, a non um, a non verbal a well being measure mm -hmm. um, for certain groups, but we've we've done it. I've done it all over all over the world. I've got and done this uh, simple, and it is a kind of like a collage uh, mm -hmm. exercise as well, where you simply put a color to an emotion on on on, on a page. And I've done it with we did it um, a couple of years ago with the whole of the UCL finance um, department. It was their way day, it was about 180 <laughs> all sticking stickers. But people got the most extraordinary amount of pleasure from just working with these. We're not too much thought, yeah. you know, just responding to, to the materials. And I, um, the, the workshop we did, Ruth, with the Architects for New Dementia Unit and that other yes. group of people, mm -hmm. Uh, they a lot of them still got there. We did that exercise with them. Yeah. They've still got theirs. That they put it on there. I've been told, and that they get a lot of pressure. And I think it's very much, though. Um, I'm sure there is another question, but I think it's also the use. It's not just a color, but it's a use of using the hands. Yes, and I yes. think you know, keeping in touch with making is something incredibly, yeah. incredibly yeah. important Agreed. to yeah. us, and that we have got away from a great. A great deal and I think that again like, like you, the walks and things it, it puts yes. us um, back in touch with that making and I think interesting down in during lockdown people have gone back to making again and mending, mm -hmm. mending yes. things yeah. and valuing things in a very very um, a, in a different different way um, yeah definitely years ago I, I started off the summer school and I was director and uh, it was a you know you know it's a big ten week thing and you know it was it was really important that it was you know it was actually successful, but if whenever there was a, a year there was a you know a really kind of um, financial crisis around Britain or the world, we'd think oh no 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 you know this is going to be ruinous for the summer school. Weirdly enough, it wasn't because people decided to spend their money differently and engage in something quite different which was more to do you know the things that we're talking about well-being yeah. what have you anyway sorry i'm i'm rapid. now there's a there's um uh a question for you ruth from mm. lorna yes I introduce <laughs> you both as artists ruth you call yourself a scientist what do you think is a difference is there a difference i will tell you there's a difference there's They're definitely there's and definitely, definitely a difference. And, and, you know, there's a simple answer to that. Can I just um, say, though, Samir Zeki says all artists are scientists. But I don't think all well, scientists you are know, um, There is oh, a vocational oh, side know, to, to yeah. science. And, um, you know, do you, if you want to find gold on your land, who are you <laughs> going to employ, me or Joe Volley? And, you know, it's, I know how to do that. I'm trained how to do that, you know? And, and, and I think artists are trained, you know, it's, there's a lot of academic rigor there. You know, I wouldn't get, um, I wouldn't get a, a geologist to come and fix the plumbing in my house. I'd get a plumber because um, they know what they're doing, you know? But I wouldn't get a plumber to go and, you know, map thrust tectonics in northwest scotland you know it's um 
that there are skills there and I you know and I'm kind of interested in the debate of you know what is art and who are artists and I think you know the reason I don't consider myself as an artist is I've got very little academic rigor in my training and ability to produce well, art. I'm step in there because I've spent my career arguing that we're all artists <laughs> and that art is accessible to all and it's not about learning how to paint like Mike, Michelangelo or, or Picasso. It's about expressing yeah. the deep inner creativity which, it, which we all have. Well, I guess that's true. And I think, you know, that's obviously, that's very much the case in singing, isn't it? But, you know, I think there's, um, you know, there's a difference between joining a, a local community choir and standing on the stage at La Scala, you know? You're not, all professional, you're not, all, you're not a professional art, you know, you're not, yeah. you're not everyone is a professional artist. I'm not a professional judge. I, I've learned a lot from Ruth over, over the years and we have this fantastic course. And we have many of the, you know, like the arts and sciences have very similar goals and, and certain kind of methodologies at mm. the time. But at the same time, I'm not, I'm not a scientist. Yeah. And and you know, know, I, I, we could talk about this forever. We could. But thank yeah. you so much. We've, we've finished. I just want to thank everybody. And I'm going to send somebody asked me if I'd talk more about the non-verbal well-being measure. Um, they could email me and I will send them an email. Thank you so much, everyone. What fun. Thank you. Okay. We could talk forever. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Joe. Um, <laughs> and uh, now we have the wonderful Kiz Banger our hip hop queen, who is going to give us a workshop with hip hop. So welcome Kiz, uh, a little bit about Kiz. Um, Kiz has had an experience of, she's experienced trauma, grief and had a breakdown. Um, and that led her to discover a therapeutic writing and she found healing through creativity. And that led her to set up Hip Hop Heals a mental health project that tackles mental health inequalities. So Kiz delivers poetry therapy style workshops with hip hop in schools, probation centers, mental health units, and homeless hostels. The aim is to develop a mental health arts on prescription scheme, utilizing and spreading knowledge and research about the therapeutic power of hip hop culture. So Kiz, are you there? Hey. I'm going to leave it to you now. I'm going to turn my video off so it's just okay. all on you. Thank you. We, uh, hopefully I'll be able to share my screen. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to just start off with a little video just to explain a couple of things um, about the birth of hip hop and why it's inherently therapeutic. So this is a gentleman called Jeff Walker who runs Rhyme Ecology. He's from the States, from LA, and he works as a counsellor but he's also a rhyming coach, uh, uh, um, like a lyric mentor. So here's him talking about hip hop. To uh, really, the start of hip hop was in the uh, early to mid seventies in in uh, South Bronx, New York City. So what was happening in New York City at the time was uh, six hundred thousand local people were laid off. Um, from the manufacturing jobs that they had and and the town went was absolutely beyond broke and they started burning buildings down uh, the people where the people were living they were burning buildings down so slum the slum lords would get the money uh, putting kids out on the street walking around in, in ab absolute ghetto poverty so what these kids did was they had they created a a, a a a whole art form out of self need for therapy. They they didn't have uh, they didn't have dance floors to go to, so they put cut out cardboard and they spun around and, and, and created b boys. They didn't have uh, counselors coming to work with them on their on their music and, and their writing and do creative writing courses like his. So 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 they were spitting on spitting rhymes on corners. They didn't. They didn't have. You know, they weren't weren't able to go out and listen to music in clubs. So they used the the records that were in their mom's houses to rhyme over rhyme over the the break beats. It was called, and and that was the beginning of hip hop basically. So from its very inception, they didn't have easels. So they spray painted on on trains going by. They created a whole a whole lifestyle uh, out of 
therapeutic need in the very beginning. So hip hop from its very beginning has always been therapeutic. And so that is the base, that's the root of hip hop. So from then until now, there's always a seed of, ther of, uh, of thera therapeutic, therapeuticness within, within the music. Um, for me, I, it was, mine was a little, for me, it was a little more unconscious because I was an ang, like, you know, every teenager ha is walking around with some sort of rebellion, some sort of anger, some, something inside of them. And even though I wasn't like, you know, in the hood, I was, I, I wasn't there. I related to the energy, the feeling, the anger, the rebellion that these MCs were saying. So I always say, like, when I heard Ice Cube say, fuck the police, I said, fuck my parents' divorce and fuck my parents' divorce that had me move to schools every two years and go uproot my life every two years and try to make new friends and, and put me as an outsider in all these schools. Fuck the police, fuck my parents' divorce. Is the same energy. It was the same energy, even though I didn't look like Ice Cube and I and I wasn't in Compton, but that I related to that energy. So, con I didn't have it consciously yet, but I knew that there was something, uh, some something healing within listening to people express their anger and their frustration, just like the same thing that was going on within me, and. We all still have that going on, but they, they, we, in hip hop now, we are the ones that are able to put put it out on a platter for you to hear and listen to, even when you, as a human being, can't put words to it. Okay, so uh, got to apologize for the swearing there, but um, we're talking about teen angst there and frustration, so we thought it was really relevant. So Jeff was talking to me on a podcast called Glow With The Flow, which I started in a response to COVID. And I was due to launch my company, Hip Hop Heels, uh, CIC, as a therapeutic writing company that combines the tenets of hip hop. So music, dance, graffiti, lyricism, and beatboxing, and self-knowledge and combining them with therapeutic techniques from music therapy, art therapy, drama and dance therapy and so on. So due to COVID, we had a change of plan. I also became unwell. And so we pivoted from delivering face-to-face -face um, workshops to doing some podcasts and creating some resource packs. So um, I'm going to show you a quick video now from a young man called Mally. So here's him on the podcast, but he was actually on a BBC Three programme called Underground Rap Trip. And it was based on two MCs with a recording studio in a van. They went around the UK and they explored hidden cities, rap scenes. So he's actually from the Wirral. And I'll let him explain a little bit about how he uses hip hop culture. Hey, you get it. I haven't hit the car in a while. Let me hit the car. Hey, hey, uh, it's a bit sore in the back. Ow. I don't need to make grand and grands. I just need to go hand in hand. I just need to see unity so the world don't snap like elastic bands. No one ever had a father figure. But trust now, I got out of mind. And it doesn't apply to you when I say that I'm doing this shit for my family. Yeah, he's serious, bro. The Wirral is just, you know, it's, it's quite a quiet place, I guess, you know, especially for people in our generation. I mean, there's not there's not much there. You might get one, two, one, two. There's no right number of rappers in the Wirral, um, but I wouldn't say there was a scene as such. Lost my vision. I'm not locked in a mental prison, riding on instrumental rhythm. Oh, there's that with potential in him. I'm not out here to make no killing. I just want you to hear me spitting. All the emotions that I'm spitting on this page when I'm late night 
the darkest times make my life with an open eye. Now I don't want to roll with them. Don't stop me when I roll with my own. The darkest times make my life with an open eye. Now I don't want to roll with them. Don't stop me when I roll with my own. Like when I was young, yeah, I was diagnosed with autism and ADHD. I never really let it, you know, be anything that's a hindrance to my life. It's just who I am, you get me? So having autism and ADHD would give me certain traits that, you know, I might be quite obsessive with the music and, you know, I might, you know, have a lot of energy sometimes. And if I can channel that energy into the right thing, like I said, these things can't be a hindrance in my life. They can only benefit me, do you know what I mean? Okay, so he's saying that the energy that he experiences is a something that he channels um, and he doesn't let things like his disability around autism and ADHD hinder him. So he channels it through his music. Okay, so how does that work in practice? So big welcome from me, I'm Kiz from Hip Hop Heels. Uh, Heels actually stands for health, education, arts and life skills. This is us. And we offer referrals to therapy, workshops and courses. We mainly target young people, men and people from minority ethnic backgrounds but we're for everybody and we include everybody. So we're gonna do a little warm up for our workshop now and put into practice some activities that I've used with young people with disabilities. And um, it will just require a bit of paper and a pen or pencil. So I'll let you choose between the image under A or the image under B. So you can pick one and draw it. So I've got a pad here. I'm just gonna give you say 20 seconds, literally a quick, quick sketch to pop it down. You can go over the lines in bold, add the dark shading if you if you see any. There's some paint dribbles and splats on the eyes for both of them. You can add a bit of shading in the background. And literally just quickly get it down. It doesn't matter how it looks. You're not gonna share it or show it with anyone. It's just for a bit of fun. Okay, just bringing that to a close now. We're gonna move on a second. Okay, we're gonna come back to that later. So. Actually, we'll, we'll finish that off now. Um, if you could uh, grab the paper again and develop it based on one of the images here. So if you like the picture on the right hand side with the um, train track mouth, it looks like it's sewing together, you could add those elements into the picture that you've just drawn. If you prefer the lollipop, you might wanna change your picture so that it's got the border of a lollipop instead of like a round face. There's some more ideas here. There's a stick in plaster on one of the eyes one of the characters. You could add some jaggedy teeth, some fangs. So aim to get the eyes, the mouth and the outline done. And just be inventive. There's no right or wrong here. Now I'm gonna flick forward to show you one more image. You can introduce a bit of colour. So if you've got a highlighter or you have a red biro, no need to get your felt tips out. 
you could add a speech bubble. Mine's looking rather ghoulish. Okay, so just bringing your piece to a close. And now we're going to do something a little bit more interactive in the chat. So pop your pencil to one side and think about how your morning's gone. Imagine if it was an animal or you were an animal this morning, what kind would you be? And if you look on the right hand side, there's a couple of ideas for inspiration in graffiti culture, which is one of the five elements of hip hop. Lots and lots of cartoon characters feature on walls and even in the little skits in between songs you have people occupying and embodying another self. So this is like an alter ego that maybe people transpose their identities between like in terms of the Jungian archetypes. So when people start to call themselves another rap name it can be seen as an alter ego where they're able to act out ideas, act out fantasies, carry energy that maybe they can't express in their everyday life. And that also carries through to the visual arts element. So let's have a look in the chat there. Uh, we've got Maya saying my morning would be a cat. I felt curious and excited. Uh, Dr. Emily Bradfield saying I've been a beaver this morning creating today's creative capture. Amazing. Law is also saying she felt like a cat. Tori saying she felt like a goat. Okay, great. Uh, Lorna's a Romanian rescue dog. I'd have to say I felt like a bumblebee. I had to drop my partner off to work this morning and then I had to do some unpacking because I've just moved house. So I've been scurrying around a little bit, buzzing about the place. Okay, we've got Rachel McNally, centipede, lots of segments, but moving forward. And Martin Fisher and Unfolding Tormos. Okay, lovely. Okay, so as part of my workshops, I like to get people to interact with text, but really it doesn't matter if you're not a writer, even though I'm using writing for wellbeing techniques around hip hop, even though we might be looking at song lyricism, to make the work really inclusive and help to tackle inequalities, um, we make sure that our text and all our resources are dyslexia friendly. Now, I think I read a stat whereby around 60 to 70% of the prison population have dyslexia. So as a, as a qualified English teacher at secondary level, I saw firsthand the impact of poverty and deprivation on people's literacy skills, and also the impact of childhood adverse experiences on people's ability to learn and cope in schools. So when we're creating routes to well-being through creativity it is essential that not only do we appeal to people's different visual senses their um, written word uh, the creative writing skills um, the musical abilities that people have but that we offer information in a in a means that people can access so lots of visual elements lots of music and um, very limited text on the screen. Because if you're a PTSD and trauma sufferer like myself, even though I've got two master's degrees around writing literature, it, I find it very hard to read. And it can be devastating because I can't access normal information online about my council tax bill or things that I need to do to help myself because of my condition. So I'd really urge you to make sure that regardless of, you know, literacy levels or poverty levels or whatever the population that you're working with to just bear in mind that traumatized people our brains don't work in the same way as everybody else's so we can lose our speech we can lose the ability to process through our working memory okay so i just want to quickly show you an activity that i did with my group um, with disabilities we looked at graffiti animals and we're not going to do this activity due to time, but just wanted to show you some local pieces around Birmingham. The bottom left fox is 
from the canal down the road, Animate, Animatrix, I think her name is. So to make this activity accessible, I wasn't expecting people to do graffiti art on a piece of paper just off the cuff. So I pieced down based on some images online. So people, one of the things to do with trauma-informed work is offer choice. So people had the chance like you just did to choose A or B and to pursue a line drawing where even though they might not be massive you know, graffiti writers or, or painters, they can still do something that is matched to the activity of uh, using spray art. So we're moving on to the last piece now. I just want to tell you a little bit about hip hop and the experience I had of making the podcast, talking to hip hop therapists and hip hop social workers. And as you saw earlier, a hip hop counselor from the States. So this is my, my board director, an expert in youth work. He's also an MC. He said, people who make hip hop have been traumatized. They express themselves through rap to relieve it and others can relate to their songs of violence, poverty and crime. MCs express lived experience of trauma. But are we listening? As I mentioned earlier, the gentleman at the start, the counsellor, the rhymecologist, Jeff Walker, he swore in relation to his anger and his frustration regarding his parents' divorce, having to move around schools. But if that's the only level that we're interacting with the music or the art form, then we're missing out on all the extra lived experience stories. So yes, there are elements of violence and poverty and crime, but if that's what was inherently part of the culture that people were surrounded by and living through when the art form was generated, when it began, um, it's going to be part and parcel of it. So let's look to the therapeutic aspects. Okay, so we've heard from Mali from the BBC Rap Trip Programme. I want to show you a quick excerpt from a conversation that I had with him for our season two of our podcast. Joe's comes the life around, then the substance had to ease up. Yeah, show us, can you, can you show us, man. Can you offer us some, what, one thing I ask every guest, right, on Glow With The Flow podcast is, can you yeah. give us maybe eight bars, 16 bars of a song either you wrote or that you yeah. love that can, be used to inspire other people to get creative. Something with a positive message that will boost. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, hey, uh, I jumped to do your little like bar now. Yeah, yeah, uh, love <laughs> 16, eight, whatever yeah, you yes. want, mate. No, what is he? All right, then. So this is something that I wrote actually about a year or so ago now. Um, well, it was, it was in a darker time in my life, but these are the type of lyrics that I would write for um, for them exactly, you know, for this sort of stuff. So um, it goes like this, it goes, I'm trying to keep contentment, but it's gonna miss. How can I be an optimist in this metropolis? I'm getting boxes ticked till there's nothing on the list. So I'm staying on the ball like it's soccer on the pitch. Overindulging in the substance, had to ease off it. Remember, I had no peas in my jeans pocket. Something came to my dreams, I was demonic. Now I preach realness through vocab with ebonics. And I'm still here telling a story, psychos. This in my head, I was poorly. I had to go to the doctor, I had to tell him to sort me. I'm feeling like my head's trying to suppress and extort me. And this is real, I ain't telling a porky. I've raised an awareness, so never ignore me. So I like that, you get me? So yeah, these are stuff that I, I would write in my, you know, and like in that verse specifically, um, I'm speaking on a specific time in my life, um, which basically was like, uh, so as the music started to pop off and, you know, become a, a more successful, you know, more shows, more bookings would obviously come along with that. And, but along with the bookings and the shows comes the life around raving and, you yeah. know, being like that. So, um, and at, at the age that I was, 19 years old, I was, you know, you were a lot more impressionable in that sense. So, um, 
during that time um, and going, uh, going a lot of places around the UK and meeting a lot of new people, I started to feel, you know, certain like feelings of like anxiety and um, I started to feel anxiety, you know, I would like try and search on the internet, you know, how I was feeling or whatever. And, um, you know, from the back of that, you know, you search your symptoms and it will say anxiety. And so from that day, I had a very hard, like two years of just being able to deal with being in any public situation, you know what I'm saying? And, and it was so hard because my, my profession puts me very much in the limelight of in the public, but my innermost feeling did not want to be, you know, out there like that, you know what I'm saying? It was very, it's a very conflicting thing to have within you. And due to that being the case, I was like, so I introduced to like certain drugs like, like Xanax and Valium and stuff like that. And when I took Xanax and Valium, these feelings of, anxiety would be instantly relieved, you know what I'm saying? And for a, nearly a whole two years, um, that was like the answer to my issues, you know what I'm saying? And obviously these are very dangerous substances to be taken. So with that being the case, you know, I, 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 you know, I went far, I took it a bit far, you know what I'm saying? Like every day, you know what I'm saying? Well, this was like trying to self-medicate sort of thing, you know what I'm saying? And this was affecting the music massively, affecting mm. my life, my relationships and whatever. It was affecting everything that I'm saying. So, um, and, and it basically stopped me in my tracks from making music for a long time. And then one day I, I thought, okay, I need to stop doing this stuff, you know what I'm saying? I just need to stop and I thought, right. So this is like January the 1st, 2018. I'm like, I'm gonna stop doing this. So I literally stopped taking what I've been medicating myself with every day for this long. And off the back of stopping these drugs, um, I actually ended up having a psychotic episode which lasted around 12 days or so. And um, it wasn't until a few days later, my mum started to notice what was going on. And I was actually hospitalized um, off the back of that. And uh, it took me about a year to actually overcome it. And like, it took me, it didn't take me too long to, to relieve myself of like the delusion that that's linked to psychosis. Right. But um, it took me a year to really settle back into myself as a character and, and become an artist again, like I did. And that, what I've just wrapped for you then was sort of, as I started to become a lot better, I want, and I wanted to speak on the, the, the turmoil that I was undergoing at that point in time. And um, I, fe I feel like it's a massive, massive like, therapeutic thing like, like like what you're saying in your thesis that you've done in your thesis i mean what what i've just said and what i've just told you is uh, a testament to, to the fact that surely just to, to to be you know to to express yourself with for your for yourself you don't need it doesn't need to be for any sort of notoriety or anything of that nature yeah thank you so much for sharing that i didn't know any of that about you Okay, now, how does this all relate to practice? So I've been talking, as you, as you can see, I've been talking to lots of people and learning about therapeutic aspects of hip hop, as well as having written a thesis around it. And one of the resource packs that I made after I became unwell again, um, was a sound system wisdom booster pack. So these are, these are free, we can send them out to all the delegates at the conference. One's from US hip hop and one's based on UK um, Jamaican sound system culture. So working with the youth panel, we one of them had a dyslexia as well. So we made this so that it was very simple and easy to use for everybody. Uh, there's a three tiered approach with different levels of, um, you could say difficulty or interaction. So really visual stimulus, quick brain um, sort of settling activity. And then in the black, you can see te the text comes from lyrics. So we actually phoned up all the MCs in this particular pack um, and asked them to offer between, you know, a, a couple of lines to four lines and just tell us a bit of inspirational 
lyricism from their repertoire that we could put in the pack and use for creative writing boosts. So these have formed the basis of lots of my workshops. One of the youth panel illustrated them. Uh, this gentleman unfortunately passed away due to COVID. So we asked another MC to pick a lyric from his songs. And this MC had also passed away a couple of years ago. So we asked another MC to pick one of his songs. And then at the end, this gentleman gave us some songwriting tips. And I combined my knowledge of writing for well-being, therapeutic writing practices, ethical safeguarding, managing boundaries, group therapeutic practice, and so on and so forth, to generate these resources and hopefully create something that's culturally competent for people to use that might not be necessarily into the average sort of poetry class. So we're going to finish off now, and I just want you to finish off with in the chat offer yourself just two kind words two or three kind words for self-care and to the other delegates maybe share a tip or something that you do that would help another person feel a boost you might not be into hip-hop you might not be into reggae but you might have your own way to find well-being so can you just drop those in the chat and I'll pass back on to Lorna. Just, just while I do, I wanna just quickly show you um, if you'd like to have a listen to the podcast. Season two is gonna be out soon. We have just been awarded, well, I've just been awarded a Developing Your Creative Practice bid in order to develop season two of the podcast with some beat making. So there's a website, there's a podcast name. And we've got a tip from Tori just to finish, saying that she journals, Roshni, roots and breath. Uh, Maya saying, really working on being kind to myself when things don't go 100%, right? Yeah. Karen, it's okay. Lorna, keep breathing. <laughs> Thanks, Kiz. Ranjita, walk in nature. Okay, Lorna, I'll pass back on to you. And Thank you, Kiz. That was really replenishing um, <laughs> and deeply interesting. I'm very grateful that you've brought some peaceful movement and a beat into our proceedings. Um, so now we have seven minutes, no, eight minutes to go, go to the loo, get, stretch your legs, get something to eat really quickly. But please promise that you're going to come back at one o'clock because we have an amazing curated conversation to come. Um, so it's definitely worth you coming back. Okay. So well done, everyone. Go and stretch your legs and refresh yourself and come back at one o'clock. Welcome back. So I'm very excited. I've been looking forward to this conversation since before the beginning. Um, and now I would like to hand over to Humira Iqbal to um, introduce our speakers, Marana and Rabia Mughal. Thank you, Lorna. Um, can I make a request that whoever's not um, in the conversation, if they could turn off their videos, please? Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. And if you are still here with us, thank you so much for still being here. Um, it's been a really interesting morning. And just I, I, kids, I loved your, your workshop. It was great. And oh, I should, I wanted to show my animal I made, but maybe I will. This is what I came up with. <laughs> Maybe we'll ask Maha and Rabia to show theirs as well. Okay, so wonderful. <laughs> e 
Excellent. Um, Thank you. Maybe at the end we could all get everyone's um, kind of art pieces. But um, just to introduce myself again, if you weren't here yesterday, um, I'm Dr. Himer Iqbal. I'm an Associate Professor of Social and Cultural Psychology at the UCL um, Social Research Institute. Um, and my work um, focuses on family and young people. Um, and I look at kind of minorities, migration, um, identity, um, and definitely in the work that I do, uh, the arts and, and you know, creativity um, kind of features a lot in it. Um, and this is kind of really great because there's three psychologists here today. And um, I know psychologists are not scared about talking about their emotions. So I do have some questions that might be kind of, I'm, I'm going to ask, I'm not going to be scared to ask them. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our two, um, you know, brilliant guests today. So I'll start with you, Rabia. Um, Rabia is, uh, Rabia Mughal is a postdoctoral research fellow at the, uh, the UCL Culture, Culture and Health Research Group. Um, and at the moment, Rabia, this is, I believe, what you're going to be talking about. You are looking at the impact of COVID restrictions on vulnerable and shielding individuals, of course, focusing on arts, nature, music, culture and well-being. So um, Rabia also has a PhD in psychology and human development from the UCL Institute of Education, where I'm also based. So nice to hear this, Rabia. And she has a background in special education and service design. Um, and then um, we move to Maha. Uh, Maha, can I just say, I love that sun in the background. It's wonderful. Um, Maha is a co-director di is the, is co of The Lens, uh, the Lived Experience Network. Now this featured um, yesterday, but I'm really going to kind of ask a lot about this today, Maha. Uh, but Maha also knows Rabia and they work together because uh, Maha is a co-director on the Community COVID uh, Project at UCL, which um, is led by um, Professor Helen Chatterjee. Uh, so Maha at the moment is studying for a PhD in psychology at Birkbeck College um, about the lived experience of daughters looking after mothers with dementia. And this is a qualitative study um, specifically focusing on crafting together. Um, and so, you know, uh, I'm really keen to hear more about this. And what's really interesting is that both uh, Rabia and Maha, and we can speak to this, have been carers. Um, uh, Rabia, um, you know, as a, a young carer, but now an adult carer, and Maha um, as an adult carer as well. And I think this is definitely um, something that I'm going to be drawing on as well. So I'm going to start the conversation. Um, and as I said, it's a conversation between the two of you. I do have some questions prepared, but we'll keep it organic. Um, first, I think I want to turn to Maha and I'm going to ask you um, to tell me a little bit about the work you're doing, about your doctorate uh, kind of research and how has been being a carer defined um, kind of the work you do and your interest in creative health? Um, uh, thanks for that introduction, um, and uh, yeah, and also really great to um, be here. And um, so yes, I'm doing the PhD. Uh, I'm like, I'm in the sort of writing up um, process at the moment. So I've kind of done all the field work and collecting data. Um, and the driver for the PhD was from my own kind of lived experience of being a carer for um, my mother who had Alzheimer's. Um, and um, when she was diagnosed in 2014, um, I think um, like many kind of, kind of carers um, who are kind of find themselves all sort of um, maybe children who find themselves in that position of now caring for um, a, a parent um, and finding out that, that a parent maybe has um, some sort of dementia. Um, you kind of go into free fall and back in 2014 there's very limited kind of support uh, for myself or my mother so I spent the first year kind of just rushing around thinking about um, how to kind of um, look after her, but almost kind of more sort of practical ways in terms of paying attention to kind of um, activities for daily living like you know making sure that you know um, uh, she was kind of um, being washed and sort of um, cared for, make sure that, you know, the um, gas wasn't on, um, you know, finding keys when they went missing, things like that. Um, and I was just kind of rushing around. And um, after about a year, I felt, I realised I was kind of sort of drifting away in terms of the activities I was kind of involving myself in. 
in terms of looking after my mother was actually kind of taking me away from her. And I had a kind of a sort of light bulb moment. I'd, I'd gone into the kitchen to make her a cup of tea, thinking, well, actually, she, she could be making herself a cup of tea. And OK, maybe making a cup of tea takes 20 minutes, but that's not, you know, it's not about speed. It's about kind of being together. And I knew my mother was good at embroidery and knitting. In fact, she had taught me. So I kind of devised a sort of project because at the time I was also have an arts background and I was teaching um, on a postgraduate at um, the um, Cass School of Art and Design. So um, I thought I would set up a project where we would come together and just be in the same space and do crafting. Um, and, and as part of that project, because it was part of a research project, I would film us crafting together. Um, and it's from that kind of experience of also looking back at the video footage of us crafting, because I was filming, that I realized that I was kind of, I, for a year I'd kind of been caught up in sort of paying, paying more attention to the diagnosis of dementia rather than paying attention to my mother as a person. And actually crafting with her um, enabled me to kind of see her for the person she still is and to kind of uncover things that she could still do, but also for her to kind of reconnect with things that she could still do. So in a world that was becoming increasingly sort of scary um, and disorientating for her, crafting um, was a way of kind of connecting with things that she could do, things that she was good with, good at, but also crafting with me as um, as her daughter, so it was very much about it being kind of social, because um, because I, I did try this earlier on of getting her to kind of craft on her own, setting up um, a task, and I realised she, that she just wouldn't do it if I wasn't there. And I realised actually it's, it's a social aspect that was just as important as well as the activity itself. And then from that. Um, I eventually kind of stopped um, uh, uh, teaching, um, spent more time looking after my mother and then realised actually maybe I'll somehow turn this into a PhD um, to kind of really kind of think about what was happening and to kind of understand it more because there's lots of anecdotal of why, anecdotal evidence of why crafting is good for us but I want to be able to kind of talk about it from in a, in a more kind of academic with more evidence base. So that's why I started doing the PhD and working with other mothers and daughters and getting them to craft as a kind of a psychosocial intervention, but also filming them as well. There's so many questions to follow <laughs> that up, but um, especially about measurement and what you mean by the intervention. But I, I want to give Rabia um, a chance to kind of respond. And so A, maybe to respond to Maha, what Maha said, because I saw you nodding a lot. And, um, and also to tell us about how, you know, a little bit about your story and the work that you do, how you've come to it, because you've done so much before you didn't do your postdoc as well, I understand. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Amma. That was really, really eloquent. And I love the way that you explained the whole process. And I agree with you that having that lived experience of, you know, having these life experiences and bringing that life experience to your research is just so interesting. And it brings a complete different depth to your research. Um, so I also have experience as a carer for my dad who has dementia. And um, I guess... The work that I'm doing at the moment at um, Community COVID is not necessarily about dementia. It's not necessarily about being a carer or even about um, any, any of these kinds of aspects, but there are little bits and bobs that I can, of, of, of experience that I can bring to, um, to, to the work itself, especially around the aspects of um, being a daughter being a carer, uh, understanding the system that my dad is in. With my dad, he's a very young uh, person with dementia. And so, you know, this is different from 
people who might be in their 70s or 80s with, with diagnoses of dementia. And so, you know, the systems that he's part of, the systems that he's, um, the, the services that he, that he uses are geared towards a certain demographic. And so kind of finding my way around those services, kind of navigating what's happening within those services has also been, you know, a big part of my carer journey. But apart from that, um, I, I can just give you a little bit of background on the, on the project that I'm working on. So it's called UCL Community COVID Research Project, and um, it's being conducted at the UCL uh, culture and health research group at the division of biosciences and we look at how non-medical interventions can help with uh, different types of health conditions so we already know and all of the really interesting conversations that have been happening today are around um, how things like art and creativity and you know things like being in nature listening to music and socializing with others so what we call these salicygenic approaches can be beneficial to our health and so what we do it um, within our research group is look at how we can evidence that. And so the community COVID part of this research is looking at how creativity, arts and other forms of community engagement have been used during the pandemic. And in particular, my work is looking at how this is all being used to address inequity. So inequity, we look at um, people with uh, socioeconomic vulnerabilities, people with physiological vulnerabilities, so physiological health conditions, and people with um, psychological health conditions. And as part of the um, project, we've been doing lots of interviews and workshops with people who are vulnerable in shielding. We've been doing lots of interviews and workshops with people that aren't vulnerable in shielding as well. Um, we've run a load of uh, focus groups and interviews with practitioners. We've sent out um, some, some surveys to practitioners, social prescribing link workers, community organisations, and um, we're writing all of this up in a, in a number of different uh, peer-reviewed publications. And I think the most important part of it is that we're also documenting the participants' experience of the pandemic through the um, through various art forms. And that's what I've been working a lot with uh, Ma uh, um, on, is working with participants um, in creating pieces of art. We did a collage workshop, very, very interesting collage workshop with vulnerable participants, um, looking at how they can express their uh, experience of the pandemic through the medium of collage. And it was a very, very interesting um, activity where you can really, really delve into how people are experiencing the world around them. I think, um, you know, there's, I think two, there's going to be two key top things that we're going to talk about. Clearly one of them is going to be the pandemic and then we can come back to can perhaps a lived experience and talking more. So, I mean, while we're on the subject of the pandemic and this work you've been doing together, so two things. One, I definitely it'd be great to hear about your experiences of working during the pandemic on using arts-based approaches. And did you do this virtually? Um, what were the challenges of that? Or, you know, because it is difficult. I've myself been doing research virtually as well. So I'm keen to hear about that. And, you know, broadly speaking, given you're doing this project, what, what would you say, how has the pandemic impacted um, creative health and has it exacerbated inequalities? I mean, I'm guessing I know the answer to this, but I'd really like to hear your kind of what your take on this, both of you. Um, I don't, uh, well, maybe um, thinking about kind of uh, exacerbating sort of um, ill health. I mean, yes, from personal experience, it, 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 it was the case for, for, for my mother. I mean, um, before the pandemic, she had seven hours a, a day of um, kind of community um, support um, and overnight it was reduced to um, 15 minutes a day and it was and, and I'm sure you know I, I wasn't the only person in that situation so it was just a kind of um, a nightmare scenario of trying to support my mother from a distance because uh, even though we both live in London she was uh, in West London uh, and I was in Southeast. Um, I, I also had kind of um, COVID at the time, but quite mild. So I was trying to kind of have conversations with social services and trying to get the support for my mother, which was 
it, it just wasn't adequate enough, but it, it, it was just trying to do the best that could be done in the circumstances because it was a very new situation and everyone was just kind of learning and, um, you know, as they were kind of, you know, day by day and just kind of running just to kind of keep up. Um, and I know just from like, you know, being involved with other kind of carers forums, um, this kind of um, newspaper articles, things in the news that lots of people who were carers or who were kind of um, in vulnerable situations because of ill health were at risk. And there just wasn't that support network in place because no one thought that this would happen in our lifetime, I guess. But hopefully things that are now being put into place will stay and actually will be kind of uh, embedded and be um, kind of there so they could be kind of drawn upon when needed and, and, and acted on very quickly. Yeah, and I think you're um, you're talking about this sort of changing way of working and how it kind of worked out that we were doing everything online and, um, you know, running these workshops online and how that sort of translates into working with vulnerable people. And it is very difficult. I felt that it was very difficult sort of way of working because if when you're taking away that um, face to face element, you're actually taking away a huge demographic of people. You're taking away people that don't, you know, that might have, that might be living rurally or, you know, that might be experiencing digital poverty or, um, you know, that don't have the time or inclination to be going onto Zoom or don't have the internet connection or, you know, just don't don't have that have that priority of, of doing um, an art, a, a collage workshop in the middle of the day. And I think that is a barrier and we we're always coming across these barriers to participation for for vulnerable for vulnerable people and in some ways the pandemic has sort of like widened those barriers and you know created a lot more barriers to participation because everything has become online everything has become over the phone and we've come across a lot of community organizations that have kind of adapted and um started going door to door with people, started doing things, um, you know, handed out iPads to care homes and, you know, um, kind of got around it, done um, art, posted bits of art and posted, you know, uh, creative care packs, this kind of stuff. Um, and I guess that's really great in lots of ways to change your way of working to, you know, be much more interactive not not face to face interactive but then it's also i wonder how how many people have sort of been left out because we've got this new way of working yeah i'm guessing i mean it's not only that i'm thinking you know third sector organizations and community organizations um so many have been impacted by funding cuts as well mm -hmm. and some of them like probably struggling to survive and you know for the audience or whoever is listening if there's anyone who has any reflections or comments you'd like to share in this please do do post i mean um kind of some of the, the challenges that you faced um through the pandemic um so coming back to kind of the actual activities that you did through this covid um kind of the um the, the research you're doing can you tell us a bit more about what was involved in uh, collage making what exactly did you do and how did you measure um kind of the the impact of this or did you feel that i mean i guess yeah, I mean, can you tell us a, bit, a little bit about how you measured this? And also, uh, Maha, in your work, maybe you could reflect on um, how you measured the impact of crafting. And do we have to scientifically measure it? Is it possible? So, Rabia, do you want to start? Um, so, um, Ma actually ran the, uh, the collage workshop, so it, um, she might be able to talk a bit more about the, the actual like artistic process, but what I can speak to very, very briefly, not, not in depth really, is about how we measure, how in that particular workshop we measured outcomes, and we didn't do it in any particularly scientific way, what we, what we just wanted to do was um, 
somehow bring the participants voice into our research and so by using the picture of the collage and a little explanation of why they've used that color why they've used that particular picture why they've um why they've uh picked this particular word to cut out and and put on the piece of paper and why they've used this sort of uh movement of of images or uh or, or this placement of images and you know those those few like it's not particularly scientific but those very um you know, uh, vague sort of broad questions actually open up a dialogue. And so, you know, somebody might be picking out words around family or, um, or uh, difficulty, or they might be using a color that reminds them of the, the mask that they're wearing, or they might be picking out pictures of various celebrities because they're thinking about what this celebrity has gone through in their life and so if you just pick out these little bits and bobs of their art I mean the, the collage itself doesn't need to look like a work of art it doesn't need to look you know particularly aesthetically pleasing or anything but what you can do is just pick out little bits and bobs and then just ask well what's the thought process behind this what's your life experience behind this and then once you ask those things you can get a very very rich understanding of somebody's life well I, I picked out this word family because I'm thinking about my family I haven't seen my mum in ages I'm, I've picked out this word difficulty because I feel like I'm having difficulty going to the shop and so you know when once you get them talking about why they've used that artistic process then you can you know create a little narrative around it um yeah as I said it's not a particularly scientific process that that we used but we're using it just to narrate people's um uh, experiences. Um, and I think yeah, I, I would actually agree with that. It, it's about kind of sort of understanding sort of individuals kind of sense making of their experience. So rather than kind of measuring it to kind of compare it with somebody else's experience, it's kind of having a more kind of nuanced understanding of an individual's experience. And then, um, and then maybe kind of building a bigger picture of what it's like to experience that particular um, uh, event. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, in terms of the, my PhD, again, it's not, for me, it's not about measuring. It is about, because um, I'm using um, interpretive phenomenological analysis. So it's about trying to kind of explore the lived experience of the daughter crafting with her mother and what that's like for her and, and, and understanding or interpreting her, her kind of sense making as she's kind of reflecting or talking about it. So it's about, um, again, as Ravi said, kind of bringing the participant's voice and kind of foregrounding that rather than us as a researcher um, are kind of goal perhaps of creating statistics um yeah i don't know if that makes sense i've never really kind of talked about it in that way before <laughs> that makes sense I, di I didn't i guess um i probably shouldn't have used the word scientific as if to say you know scientific is some superior way of that wasn't what i meant but i think we've kind of understood and it's about hearing the voices I, there's different ways of of kind of establishing if something's working and I guess during a pandemic when everyone's so isolated you know even to get people to come together is is, is really you know just it's great that, that you were able to achieve this and um, Maha I wanted to ask you more about uh, your PhD work now um is it I'm wondering like positionality or, or our own positions as researchers or kind of investigators do you find it to be it must be very emotional for you or quite difficult for you to to work with um on this topic which is obviously quite close to to your own experiences so i mean um how, what do you do to kind of distance yourself from the topic or do you find that you don't need to do that it actually helps you in your work um yeah i mean it's it, it hasn't been 
Um, I mean, because my mother passed um, away, um, I think last July, and so I'm, I'm, and I've kind of realised that I'm kind of writing up the data, and I'm reading accounts of daughters talking about their mothers, and I was kind of curious whether it would be kind of triggering for me, and and it hasn't, and in a way, it's been quite sort of life affirming because I'm kind of still connecting or having memories with my mother, and it's quite nice that it's this kind of she's kind of always there, but quite sort of, you know, very present. But I think when I was maybe doing the field work um, very much, and I'm sure this is with other kind of qualitative uh, methods, uh, I was kind of keeping a reflective journal. So before I, I would do my field work, I would write down my kind of, my expectations and my fears or, or, or just kind of thoughts before I would go and meet the, the mother and daughter and do the field work, because I was, going into people's homes and asking them to do the acti to do the activity um which even i kind of realized that i'm going you know de de dementia care in people's homes is is very hidden you know it, it, it's not really seen in the mainstream and if it's kind of represented in mainstream whether on tv or in books often it's very it's not it's not very nuanced and it's 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 often um, focusing on kind of aspects of burden and it's it, it's quite one dimensional so the, the realities of dementia care is is hidden until you're kind of faced with it um so i was realizing that i was kind of going into people's spaces so i was very nervous each time and also filming them um but you know doing the crafting so i would write down how I was feeling before and then after I'd kind of met with them I'd also write my kind of my kind of experience of that as well so I was just kind of touching base with myself but kind of just writing about it I think because I'm writing up um, and reading the sort of daughter's accounts and just kind of discovering this the way they're kind of thinking and I think with all the participants there's a sense that at the beginning, and even during, at the beginning of the, of the um, intervention, you know, this craft and activity, um, and even afterwards when I was asking them to reflect, because um, I was then interview the daughter separately, not with the mother, and kind of asked them, what was it like crafting with your mother? Even then they were kind of talking about the mother as well, you know, she can't, she's, it's a shame, she used to be brilliant at sewing, but she can't sew anymore. She was so great at knitting, but you know, she's lost that skill. I'm having to kind of show her. And then halfway through the interview, I would show them the video footage. And it often kind of highlights that, you know, you can be doing an activity or you could be with somebody and you, you just have this assumption that they are kind of acting in a particular way that's maybe, um, you know, and maybe their kind of perception is um, prejudiced by the dementia um, uh, diagnosis. But when they saw their mother crafting, um, they were so taken um, by surprise by the kind of the, you know, how brilliant their mothers were and how we had like one mother who's like 99. And the speed that she was knitting at was it's faster than I could do, do or, or the daughter. So this skill that these these mothers had that, that they had learned as a, as kind of very young, they still had this kind of haptic knowledge, and also they were kind of talking in a way as well to their daughters, where they were kind of sharing things. So being able to watch the film, the daughters were able to kind of see their mother in a different way and beyond the, di the di dementia diagnosis, which is kind of quite similar to um, what had happened for me. So I kind of knew, I, I thought there was something there that, that, you know, the crafting can enable things to be kind of brought to the surface that perhaps, you know, if you kind of, if you approach dementia care following the very kind of biomedical model that it's about kind of loss um then you're going to care in a particular way or you're going to see that person in a particular way but actually crafting was about kind of um was a, it was about um i can't remember what the expression is about it was about kind of assets that were still there 
and um, building on um, the skills that the, the mothers, mothers often um, had. And also, mm -hmm. just as another anecdote, my mother, before the uh, pandemic, she was going to a community centre, and it was really nice because they would get children brought in from a local school, and some of the older ladies would be teaching the children, 10-year-olds, how to knit and so, so it was nice that, you know, some of these women who had dementia were still recognized as being skilled and knowledgeable that they had stuff to share with other people. Mm. Of being of value, I guess. Exactly, um, of contributing to the world. Mm -hmm. Yes. I guess like uh, the power of a label, isn't it? The power of a, a label and kind of all that it comes with it and what, when it kind of what it, what other people see it as and you know expectations and I mean Maha um I, Rabia I want to I'm going to give you I want to give you a chance as well to respond but I wondered both of you sent me really brilliant and beautiful pieces of work I asked if there was something you wanted to share with the the wider audience Maha you sent me um a short film and there's a clip that you you thought you might want to share and mm. Rabia you sent me some beautiful paintings would you like to kind of um share these with the group now and then maybe talk about them that could be a nice um kind of a, a way to kind of wrap things up in a sense so um Maha would you like me to share the video or would, would you like to do it um I'll share the um video because because I won't show um all of it um and uh let's um so I had um I'd, I'd kind of set up this project with my um with my mother and I was we were going to kind of embroider pillowcases and it's quite interesting because she kind of disrupted the activity because I showed her what I'd started off with. And she's like, yeah, well, that's kind of looks OK, but it could be better. So and I was thinking, what? You're kind of criticising my sewing. But I thought, no, let's go with this. You know, this is really good. So she then started sewing me um, an embroidery technique called hem stitching, with which I'd not heard about before. So this is a little bit where I'd been um uh practicing the technique that she'd been showing me and then i was showing her so i'll just show maybe a minute of the film Maha, sorry to interrupt. Should there be sound with this clip? Oh, is there no, is the sound not coming through? Sound's not coming through. Ah, okay. That's okay. I mean, perhaps you could describe what the clip was about. Yes, because, um, sorry about that. Um, so um, I, I showed my mother the, um, um, that the, um, uh, Actually, it had, um, sorry, I was thinking because I did have um, um, subtitles, but anyway, so I showed my mother the, um, the stitch and I'd done and she kind of said, um, she was saying, oh, did you do that? And I said, yes. She said, oh, well, that's really good. And she said, but you know, what you can do. And then she kind of showed me how I could kind of um, improve on my work. And it was quite a turning point for me because my mother really kind of shifted to being the sort of the teacher um, and, and I was kind of learning from her. And so it was, it was actually quite an emotional moment. And it, it was just a, it was a nice moment where I was really in that moment being her daughter and she was being the mother. And that kind of dementia carer role had really just kind of flown out of the window, even just for a few minutes. And I was just kind of back being present of being myself. And that was such a valuable moment um, for me. 
I was really shame I couldn't, um, maybe I'll share the, the link to the Vimeo in, in the chat, but what the technology is of Zoom. It's such a beautiful, such a beautiful video. I was really lucky to hear and, and listen to it all, so it would be great if we could, if we could share it. Um, Rabia, I'm mindful that, um, you know, we haven't heard from you for a bit, so is there a kind of, is there any responses you would um, kind of like to give Maha, or um, is there some of your own work that you'd, oh, I, I can share the screen as well, but is there some of the work of your own work you'd like to share? Um, yeah, I can, I can share the, the two pictures that I, that I sent you, and then I can just read out the explanation, and I think it's a really beautiful explanation, so shall I do that now? Yeah. Uh, can you see that? Yes. So um, these are two uh, beautiful watercolour paintings that um, I was sent by one of uh, my participants. And um, she gave an explanation as to what they mean. And she said that my art involves travelling into surreal landscapes and mythologies using watercolour, dip pens, textiles or clay. Each of the materials brings a different dimension. There's a lot of whimsical animism to my work created by the ink uh, layers that I add to the watercolors. These stories only come through once the piece is finished and I spend my time looking and watching it all unfold. My process with the watercolors is rapid as is the ink laid on top. My pen dances in all directions, adding the tiny ink marks. Art allows me to travel in ways I no longer can due to being mainly housebound. There is flow and energy and movement, everything my disability has taken away from me. These microcosms represent how small everything has become since falling ill and yet gives me so much expanse to fall into. I love to explore and disappearing in, and I love to disappear into this into these worlds for a few hours because they bring me deep well-being and that is my motivation and the end results are the joyous byproduct. Thank you Rabia. Just to just to explain because we missed the first just the first tiny bit. So these um paintings these emerge from is it from work you did on the COVID um uh, project? Uh, not these particular paintings themselves. These are actually just uh, paintings that uh, were painted uh, beforehand by one of the participants who um, we did some of the interviews with. And um, this participant loves to uh, just, just paint, just paint in watercolours. And the whole conversation was about how have you been um, using art to express yourself and how has that sort of happened during the pandemic? And so, you know, she sent me these, these beautiful uh, paintings and that was the explanation. Wonderful. Um, Maha, do you have any responses to that? Yeah, no, I, I thought they were really just kind of poetic and, and engaging and sort of this, there was kind of a sense of freedom in the line and the flow of just kind of, 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 of expression. And I think that's what kind of sort of creativity can, can allow you to kind of um, experience. And I remember, Rabbi, you were telling me that when you, because we sent out these kits for the for the college workshop and, and Rabbi had sent one of the kits out to somebody and I think they don't they kind of they couldn't wait for the workshop but they started collaging kind of as soon as they got the kit and was sending Rabia <laughs> that their kind of artwork and I thought that was really nice you know just yeah. that kind of wanting to kind of just throw yourself in it but also to kind of share with other people yeah there's that, there's that desire for expression um, we have five minutes left um, and, you know, this has been such a lovely, we've taken a lot of different angles in this uh, conversation, but it's been really great. Um, I, I think there's one question which is about um, kind of research approaches, but if it's okay, um, Eva, I mean, I, I might ask Maha and Rabia to respond to you in chat about that. Um, I think, you know, a nice way to end this would be maybe to hear just a little bit more about the lived experience network and if um, if there's ways um, of people getting involved or if you have any, you know, call outs or any kind of um, thing you'd like to say. Um, so um, Maha, uh, Rabi, I mean, uh, Rabi, I'm not sure if you're involved with the network as well. Maha, would you like to say anything uh, about about the network? Um, 
Yes, I mean, I'll, I'll keep it quite brief. I mean, we had Julie yesterday, who, who was the kind of national coordinator, and actually she was the one who kind of got me um, uh, on, on board. Um, so yes, the lived experience uh, network is a kind of a national uh, network of people who um, have experience of using kind of um, creativity for their own um, live, um, sorry, for their own well-being and health, or for other people's well-being and health. Um, and we kind of we advocate for um, creativity to kind of be sort of central to um, um, the health and well-being um, interventions um, for kind of individuals or kind of communities. Um, uh, so, and also like um, we, we um, heard um, Kiz earlier, who is um, the um, champion for the East Midlands. So we have champions um, that of other seven regions of, the, um, of England. So what I'll put in in the chat, I'll put in um, an email if people want to, um, and find out a bit more because we're always looking for people for new members and i'll put a link to our page that is on the culture health and well-being alliance website and it gives you a bit more uh background but we, we kind of work with the culture health and well-being alliance but also the national center for creative health so we're kind of this family and, and the lens was kind of established as one of the recommendations from the um the, um, the Creative um, Wellbeing Report, 2017 report from the APPG um, Arts and um, Wellbeing um, Group. So yeah, I don't want to kind of talk too much more about that, but I'll kind of put some details in the chat um, now, yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be great because, you know, for people who might not be familiar with all of these organizations and if they wanted to get in touch, mm. Um, and I think, I believe Larna will be circulating, you know, more detail about the, um, this. And so I guess, I mean, we've almost at the end, do you have any con concluding thoughts or reflections, maybe, uh, you know, about your own work or about the kind of, I guess, the conference in general? Um, I can just quickly answer Eva's question about person-centered and quality yeah. research um, approaches. So she said, how do person-centered and quality research approaches such as the ones used here respond to the largely quantitative impact reporting requirements for funded projects. So a lot of our project is actually working on um, how we can measure these um, very qualitative things in a quantitative way. And one of the things that I would um, direct Eva towards is uh, the uh, Public Health England framework written by Norma Dakin that um, we've been using quite a bit of and um, are hoping to develop in the future to do exactly that, use these qualitative approaches to quantify um, impact and then use it in a way that's um, funder funder friendly. It's a big challenge, Ravi, and when I struggle with myself, and I, I mean, I agree with you, but I mean, I think maybe the funders need to change their thinking about how they measure, <laughs> you know, and how they think about, you know, what we can get out of creative approaches and kind of, you know, you know during the pandemic, I don't, I think the, we've seen nature, the, how nature has been so important, getting out outdoors and, and you know, so yeah, but it, it all comes down to numbers often, which is, which yeah. is a good thing. And I do hope that um, this changes, I, I feel. There's so um, much that we know that we just know, but that, you know, <laughs> we have to be able to quantify and uh, yeah. Well, I'm sure next generation and also people here will be some of some of you will be on the boards of funding bodies and so you know we'll be able to make changes. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much to both of you. We could have talked for a lot longer. Um, there was so much to say about your amazing work and um, um, I, I thank you for sharing the links as well and I really appreciate you both taking out the time today. So thank you again to both of you. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, um, Rabia Ma Maha. Um, that was fascinating and deeply engaging. Maha, if you could email me the information um, I, about Lens and I can um, forward it to all attendees and people who've signed up. And we are reaching the um, evening of the conference experience. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Now we're going to look at Emily Bradfield's creative capture of day two. So I would love it if, if attendees could um, post feedback and comments and thoughts in the chat whilst we're looking at Emily's 
brilliant image. Please write something in the chat that we can take away. Um, some feedback would be lovely. So we saw Emily yesterday um, and had the brilliant creative capture of the conference yesterday. Emily is an independent arts consultant who supports people to reimagine evaluation and manage projects creatively. She's the, cre she's the charity director of Arts and Minds and she has a PhD in creative aging from the University of Derby. So over to you, Emily. I'm gonna try a different technique today to see if I can share my screen because I've taken a picture of today's creative capture. So I'm hoping that this is gonna work. Fantastic. Can you see that? Oh, wow, yes. So here's today's wow. creative capture. Um, it was interesting, quite different and a bit less compact and dense as yesterday's. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed doing this one. Um, the mountain. Can you see the mountain? Mountain, where's the mountain? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the triangles? The mountain on the bottom left to top right. There's a line. Ah, okay, so that's a line coming, there's quite a few lines, yeah, so there's some lines coming out from your comment, I think it was Lorna, expressing deeper, deep inner creativity. So there are some pink lines that come out and go to all four yeah. corners. There are also, there's also on the left hand side, a yellow hand and a green hand, because there was a lot about the using your hands and that, that tactility of engagement. Um, so yeah, there are quite a few sort of subtle lines in the background. And what did you do in Kiz's hip hop workshop? Yeah, so I don't know if you can see on the right hand side at the bottom, there's a self care heart. Above that, that was my um, little image. That's your, your face. Yes, I did that one as well. Yeah, um, so I caught, captured that. Uh, yeah. And I thought it was really interesting also to add on the right hand side going the other way on the page more words to describe creativity creative engagement the arts um, which was really interesting and it took me back to my phd where in the focus groups i ran with older people we explored what participatory arts were and i was just trying to find the image but i haven't managed to find it but Quite, I might do a, another creative capture of all of those different creative forms and activities. And tell me, with, with the sharing and engagement uh, in the middle, yeah, um, that looks like a ship, a, 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 a symbol on a ship. Um, it was just sort of two arrows showing continuity and the connection between sharing and engaging. I love it. And the barriers. What, is that, is that, that's literally a barrier. It's literally a barrier like you'd have on, a, on roadworks. Yeah. But it was thinking about those barriers to participation and engagement, whether it's the digital divide, whether it's accessibility, transport. Yeah. And you've got art and science interlinked. Yes. I have indeed. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. No, well, you're welcome. Does anyone have any comments or um, want to say anything about Emily's beautiful picture? Mm. It's a work of art. Oh, Thomas says, what's the word in green that's cut off on the bottom right? Uh, flourishing. Flourishing. And then, Sis Marsha says, teach me how to draw, love it. And Maya <laughs> says, Emily, are those two hands on either side? Yes, so there's a yellow line. I drew around my hand. Um, and then oh, I, yes, you did. And then I drew around my right hand, which was quite difficult because I'm right-handed. Um, so it's a bit, more, a bit wobblier. Um, yes, so two hands placed on the page. Um, and in response to the, can I teach it? It's taken me five years to develop this technique. Um, so I can give you some pointers, 
but then you'll have to go away and explore your own um, approaches. Lots of people use visual note taking, which is quite a different technique to creative capture that I use. Mm. And do you do um, classes or group work workshops, Emily? Um, I haven't done. I've been asked several times to do them. Um, I think it's one of those things that um, I feel quite attached to my creative captures. I think it's my unique style. Yeah, um, you don't want I, to share it. I want, I'd be quite willing to uh, run sessions on visually capturing notes yeah. and, and expressing yourself that way. And as you know, I love a post-it note. Um, so yeah, I've delivered workshops on post-it notes and, and using similar techniques, um, but creative capture is my trademark um, approach. Yes. Um, well, fantastic. Does anyone have any questions? Because we've got a few minutes before the end. Does anyone have any questions for me? Or any thoughts about what we can all take from this conference? Because I don't want it to be sort of a full stop, that's it. Bye bye. Uh, I think I've certainly learned an awful lot in over the past couple of days. And I'm very grateful to the team behind the scenes who've helped make it happen. Um, my fellow chairs um, and also um, very grateful to um, the Grand Challenges who funded um, the Creative Lives project, which has enabled it to happen. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What's, what's uh, inspired you the most over the two days? Um, I think I was really inspired by the aging playfully this morning because it made me rethink youth and the contours of play. Mm -hmm. And also the film, Jumana Aboud and uh, Yesterday, uh, the talk of the, the film um, of Palestine, mm -hmm. that was exquisite and touched me emotively. I, I was really affected by it. The stream, the river, you know. Yeah, beautiful. What about you? Well, I was really, really also inspired this morning by the, the um, playful aging because it really resonated with my PhD research on creative aging. And it just reminded me of some of my favorite older people, um, creative groups that I came across throughout my PhD research one of which was the graffiti grannies who are based in Lisbon who are no. there in their 80s and 90s so that um, conversation about age and whether graffiti is a young person's thing not necessarily um, also another one is the hip hip operation crew no. who are a New Zealand based um, hip hop dance group and there again they're all in their 80s and they compete internationally um, so yeah, I was reminded of those. And then also one from my, from my PhD research was for my systematic review, um, was an article on shag dancing, which is um, a form of, uh, it's a bit based on Charleston, but it's done as a partner dance on the beach. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from, from that article was, now we just shag all the time, which you need some cultural context. So I will be sending an email to everyone with links to the recording of this pod of this um, conference today and yesterday, and also the PowerPoint slides of, of the presenters, speakers who gave who showed PowerPoints, and links to websites and videos, all the information you need. Now, I, one thing I don't know is how to download the chat from a Zoom. Does anyone know how to do that? Yes, you should be able to click on it, Lorna. I don't think I can. Um, yeah, but maybe we can talk about it when everyone's gone, but um, I don't I want to send you the chat. It gives you the option to save afterwards. Okay, thank you. So I will be sending everyone emails um, and so you'll hear more from me and I don't want this conversation to end. Yes, there will be more events happening. I've just won a, a new research fellowship at UCL um, doing more um, 
work like this. Um, I, you will have my hooray. email. Hooray, hooray. <laughs> Thank you. You will have my email address because I'm going to be sending you emails. Um, so thank you very much. And we are five minutes early, but that gives you a chance to go make yourself a cup of tea or whatever you like to drink. So I'm saying goodbye now. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye then. Thank you, everyone. Do you, do you need any help with anything, Lorna? Just do you know how to download the chat? Because it didn't yeah. give me an option last time, yesterday. I was, I was just Googling that, trying to see. Um, I'm not Normal, sure. Normally, you should be able to, I can't, it doesn't seem to be giving me the option. You should be able to, in the chat, I think, there should be a little button that you can click and it says, do you want to download? We're still recording, by the way, Lorna. Oh, yes, I just stopped the recording. Mm -hmm.